Let's see how good the live really is. I'm hoping, hoping, hoping that the audio is coming through just fine, but I can't hear it just yet. That's no good. Ah, there we are. Okay, audio is coming through just fine. Hallelujah. Hey there, everyone. Welcome. Cats. Yes, cats indeed. And let me just tell you this. For those who have no idea what uh, what to expect for uh, from uh, Mysterious Disappearances, which is an anime that I definitely encourage people to check on out, uh, that cats. Woo. There, uh, the cats in in the in the show lead to one of the most emotional moments I have had when reading a manga. Uh, I really hope that the anime manages to to hit that same emotional note uh, because it's both so beautiful and so sad all at the same time. Uh, when you get to the story behind the cats that are all throughout. Uh, mysterious disappearances Mwah. and it's not just because i'm a cat person who owns three cats it, it is i think for anyone who is a pet owner that moment is going to hit hard and if i have any any true intuition they'll probably be, be they'll probably be in the last episode of of the season so welcome to everyone. I see Chloe here. I see Rubens. I see Hannah. I see KTW123, the amazing gamer, 111. Fantastic. Great to see you guys all here. Ooh, Iconic is here as well. So fantastic. Say we won't dive into murder drones just yet. Hi, hello, ISO. And to you, uh, Galactica Knight 101. Fantastic. Great to see you guys here. We won't dive into murder drones just yet because I have a feeling that that's what most people are here for. And I want to make sure that I give just a little bit of buffer space uh, for everyone. So that way they have a chance to come on in and then we can start talking about uh, murder drones because I, I, I am looking forward to this talking talking battles, doing fight analyses, comparisons, and getting writing advice out of that is some of the stuff that I did a whole lot of earlier on when we transitioned from just a podcast on over to doing YouTube. So uh, this will kind of be uh, returning a little bit to my roots, and I'm looking forward to that. Uh, and... And to and to quickly, yes, I have a video that just finished uh, that just finished uh, rendering, so that way I could put it up here. I will regal you guys uh, uh, for and gals for about the next eh, five or five ish or so minutes uh, before we then dive again into murder drones with a story that I will use some murder drones uh, footage for because. Uh, Bit because it, it fits. Hold on a sec here as I quickly pull up some footage from the promening. And my reason for that is <laughs> so, uh, for those who may not be in the United States, uh, we have entered prom season uh, the, the, with the month of April. Uh, I know some schools do prom uh, in May, and then there are some schools that, for whatever reason, do prom. In the uh, uh, in the month of March, which uh, just seems way too early, especially because you got spring break in the middle of all that. In any case, uh, I've already done a video sharing my own prom story, which if you think that Uzi and and N had a weird prom, uh, then my prom story I will offer up as a, as a counter to theirs for potentially the absolute weirdest. <laughs> but because that video is already out for you guys to watch, I won't repeat it so much here. Instead, I will tell you about uh, about one of the craziest uh, dances that I went to when I was in college. And in order to understand this particular dance, which was supposed to be a couples dance, no one other than couples were allowed into this dance. I snuck in as a stag. I came in single, ready to mingle, ready to break up. Uh, relationships 
<laughs> and and so that was my mentality coming on into this. But before but before I actually can talk about that dance, you need to understand the three girls who would play a massive part in that particular night. And I had met them at a previous uh, dance at the on the college campus. I I sadly cannot remember their names. It's been long, long ago. Uh, but uh, you had you had two gorgeous model looking friends who then had basically a duff. And I know that that can for some people it might be a little bit like, oh, why would you say that? I'm sorry, but that's that's what she was. She was a shorter, rotund girl, really cute, actually, really beautiful face and fantastic personality. Guys and gals, it is about the personality. Personality lasts longer than looks. Well, so I had met these three girls at a dance months previous on a college camp on the college campus at another dance, and I had asked out one of the taller girls for a dance, and then the other two whoop, came along with us and sandwiched me and the other girl. It was really awkward, really weird, and I I was like, well, this is odd. You know what? If these two girls want to dance, then why not just group hug dance? So I'd like put out both of my arms. And I'm like, okay, let's let, let's dance here. And the other two girls got in on it. And I was like, okay, this is strange. I'm dancing with three girls at the same time in a slow dance. Mm hmm. Yeah. Okay. We're, this is happening. This is happening. All three very pleasant girls. And after that, I thought to myself, okay, well, that was fun and weird let's ask out the short girl and see what's going on here i ask her out to the net i ask her out for the next dance and then the other two girls didn't bother sandwiching and i was like okay that's odd so i so after that was all done i i became a wallflower for a little bit and i observed these three girls and i watched as all these guys come on over and they're all like yeah i'm gonna ask out one of these model chicks yeah and they would ask out the model girls and then the other girls, the other tall model girl and then the short girl would come and sandwich them. And when that happened, you, I would watch as every single dude bro be like, what? Oh! And they would freak out and have no idea what to actually do about these three girls sandwiching them in the middle of a dance. And, uh, and I observed, I, I, I observed through my own experience and from other guys that if you asked out the short girl first, then the two model girls would dance with you without the other two interfering and sandwiching you. And, uh, and so I, I, I learned the secrets. So fast forward months later <laughs> and I go to, as I sneak into this dance that's only meant for couples. And I come in single, ready to mingle, and I'm going to break up some, some romances because it's around Valentine. It's after Valentine's Day. So that means that relationships are ready to be burst. <laughs> that's, a, uh, that, that's, a, that, that's just what happens after Valentine's Day. Uh, lots of relationships, unfortunately, just go down the hill. <laughs> so I come ready to break up relationships. And... Uh, and, and there's, of course, all these couples there. And I see the three girls. And so I just come on over and I'm like, hey, how's it going? And they're like, hey, we're doing good. We didn't realize that it was supposed that you were supposed to bring like a date or something. I'm like, wait. And did, and did they just let you through the front door? And they're like, yeah. I'm like, and I had to sneak in. What the crap? Uh, so uh, there were these there are these guys again, more dude bros coming after the model chicks and again just the whole repeat of that thing just going down where the girls would once again sandwich them one guy got so freaked out that he grabbed the girl he grabbed one of the model girls and hauled her all away across the dance floor uh which was which was rather substantial he was hauling her all around the building <laughs> as these other girls kept chasing after him trying to sandwich him and their friend <laughs> He was freaking out the entire time. And so after that, after that, I after that, I, I had a good laugh. And then the th three girls came back. They went back to being wallflowers. And I came on over. I was like, I get the next dance with all three of you. And they're like, okay. <laughs> and so for the next dance, 
I'm there with all three girls doing her thing, and all I get all these angry looks from all these dudes who are just like, "How, like, dude, you, you're a you're, you're a goober. How did you get in here with two models and this cute plump girl? That, that's that's no, that's not fair." <laughs> And I had guys coming up to me every like throughout the night whenever I wasn't with those three girls being like, Lars, how did you do it? And I and I was just like, animal magnetism. I happen to know the spell, abracadabra. I didn't tell anyone else the secret to how to dance with these three girls. That all you had to do was just ask out the short one first, and then the two models would dance with you all you want. <laughs> uh, so Hannah. Let me say, no, serious, what sandwich someone meaning? So when I'm saying sandwich, like, so let's say you're dancing with a person. Let's say you're doing a slow dance or you're doing bump and grind, what have you. That means that the other two people come from the sides and start slamming you. And so, and, and so you're trying to dance with one person. And the next thing you know, two others come and just start bumping you. It's like shoulder, shoulder grinding and just make it very awkward and uncomfortable. <laughs> That's what was happening. That's what they would do to anyone who tried to ask out one of the two models without asking the short girl first. <laughs> so they would make it intentionally awkward, as awkward as they could possibly make it. Uh, so that way you would either be forced to give up the dance, which most guys wouldn't do but would have no idea what's happening to them or they would then learn oh ask out the short girl first and then and then everything is fine <laughs> so uh yeah that was uh that, that was one of the more epic uh dances post prom that i ever went to the night that i snuck into a dance that was meant for couples and uh ended up with three girls as my date for the night <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> either either psychic good to have you here and then as people begin to say prom night's one of the weirdest anyone could ever attend it is true you have to be in the mood and attitude for prom uh both of my nieces are actually about to go to prom oh not tonight but they've got prom in like two weeks and they're getting all uh, all ready for it and one of my nieces is it doesn't like being around a whole lot of other people, but she's like, it's prom. I might as well go once just that way I can say I did it and don't have any regrets after graduation. <laughs> My other niece is an absolute, uh, is an absolute social magnet. She pulls people to her. So going to the prom is just, uh, is just natural for her. Robux. I don't dance, never have, and never plan to. Oh, that's sad. Dancing is fun. I enjoy dancing. I'm not a great dancer, but you know what? Most people aren't either. You just learn to move in really weird ways and look confident doing it. And, uh, and then boom, <laughs> it's all good. Psychic asks, how was your prom? I actually have a video about my prom and the ridiculousness behind it, the whole entire story. And what's more, I even tie that in to how you can write dance stories <laughs> because there is actual writing advice that can be gleaned uh, from a really crazy prom experience. Uh, Hannah, good Lord, I'm glad I'm not in that prom. I so such a rebel. Uh, Chloe, man, I hope my prom is this interesting. You know what? Proms are really interesting. Uh, um, if for anyone who hasn't yet gone to a prom and is interested, go with some friends, go with some friends, try, make sure that the drama isn't really high. If you have any friends who are like, I really need to go out with this one person, let them do their own thing. Don't let them be a part of the group. I know that sounds kind of mean and everything, but if you want to have a chill, fun prom experience, don't make it all about the dating. Don't make it all about, ooh, who's going to end up with whom. The first girl I asked out for prom turned me down flat. Uh, that was rather embarrassing. And then uh, one of my really good friends uh, reached out to me and he was like, Lars, I know you've been turned down. I'm like, Oh, please don't remind me. And he's like, he's like, now then how would you like to ask out Tegan? I'm like the forward on the basketball team. He's like, yeah, the forward of the basketball team. I'm like she's a foot taller than me. <laughs> he's 
like, so she needs a date to the prom. You need a date to the prom. You're asking her out. Come on, tonight we are going to we're going to make sure that you ask her out. And uh, we went and we filled the back of her truck with water and made a pond out of it with a bunch of fish. <laughs> <laughs> and uh it was fun i i got to go to the prom with a girl who was a foot taller than me and uh and could easily have bent me into a bow uh but uh she was a she was a great prom date i wanted a great group it was fun the prom itself was hell <laughs> and again if you want to fe- if you want a full-on description of what that was like go check out the video because I go into full detail about why the prom ended up being hellish and just how awful it became. All because one girl wanted to stick it to everyone else on campus. One girl ended up destroying everything. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> so, Roblox, can someone answer a question? Yes, Roblox, what is your question that you have? And as you're writing that down, uh, Jaws says, there's no way I'm going to prom, no way in hell. I'll die before I go. Uh, Game Lord asks, what the hell's going on? Ain't nothing wrong with Taller Lazy, says the Amazing Gamer. You get me. You get me. Uh, Samp Shorts, I am not going if I end up like that kid who got crushed by Doll. You know what? There's a very good chance that you won't get crushed by someone like Doll. And then we're actually going to get a little bit into that tonight. <laughs> Uh, Roblox, if someone asks, uh, what is your snap? What does that mean? They're probably asking you to, uh, give them your Snapchat ID is my, my guess. I don't know who uses Snapchat anymore these days. <laughs> uh, uh, Chloe, I'm either going to prom with my cousin and some of our friends at my old high school, or one of my friends might take me either way. I already know it'll be chaos. Yeah, prom is chaos. Prom is chaos. But Chloe, again, if you can go with a good group of people, I, I'm pretty certain that you'll have fun. And here's the thing. You don't have to stay at prom all night long, especially if you've got someone who has a ride. You can leave and go do other things. Me and my group of friends, we left prom early, and we went and we had our own dance in the middle of a dark parking lot because prom was awful. <laughs> Uh, KTW one two three. I'm that guy in prom that just stands around and there and is there for the food. <laughs> hey, the food can be good. You just gotta watch out if anyone's been doing anything to it. <laughs> uh, Rubens, yes, I have to use the circular glasses nerd emoji joke right now. Yes, please, so, Ruben. So Lars, uh, so Lars is. Lars is in the closet thing I had for a prom. I had four girls to dance. My my friends were like. How the dude never opens his mouth in the whole year. Turns out nerd glasses and physics puns work. Yes. Yes, they do. <laughs> nice going, Rubens. <laughs> Not going to lie, that would be me. The Amazing Gamer proms better as a meet-up spot to leave and then go have your prom free of charge. Exactly. Exactly, the Amazing Gamer. <clears throat> so... With that story, <laughs> with that story of dances and craziness on out of the way, I've had my chance to brag about younger Lars doing doing something that older Lars will probably never get away with again. <laughs> and let's begin moving on. So for tonight, tonight we are going tonight the main focus is going to be looking at the fights from murder drones. And what I want to do is I want to have a look at fights from each one of the episodes. My goal in this is that uh, for those of you who are interested in writing your own action sequences, uh, who are like, ooh, I would love to write a big fight scene or a cool fight scene. How do I do it? My hope is that you get some good advice, some good insights uh, that you can then use for your own stories. And then for those of you who are just here for the fun of it, that's totally fine. My hope then is, is that you might be able then to get some insights into writing action sequences and fight scenes that will either help you to appreciate some of the fights even more that are in murder drones or to better understand why some action sequences, either in murder drones or in other shows or in books or in show or in movies, don't work out the way 
that you thought that they would. Like, you're like, man, that was fun, but just something isn't quite, mm, it's not quite doing it for me. You're then able to say, okay, then, well, thanks to having learned a little bit more about writing uh, fight scenes, I can now say better why something does or doesn't work for me. And, uh, and then we can all walk away a little bit more edified and engaged than we were here at the beginning of the stream. And once we've done that, uh, we'll then have, uh, I'll just want to do like a little quick roundup of some of the anime that I watched this week. Some of the cool stuff that I thought came out of that. And then finally, to wrap things up for the night, talk with you guys about the stories that you are currently writing and what kinds of advice you might be looking for. Answer some of your questions. And that is how we will run from here. I expect that this might go on for maybe two hours. We'll see. Uh, I don't, I can't go on forever, <laughs> uh, no matter how much I might want to. Uh, so uh, from about two hours from now is probably then when I have to say, look, it's time to just wrap things on up. And hopefully we hit all of those things by then. Uh, so real quick, uh, before we, before I flip the videos on over, uh, <laughs> uh, answering some of the questions right here. KTW123 asks, has there been any fight in your prom? Yes, I nearly got slugged in the face by one of the football players uh, from my school because the guy was zoused drunk. He was very angry drunk, and one of his good friends from the team had to keep punching him and shoving him down in order to prevent him from tearing anyone apart at the prom. Uh, other than that, I don't really remember any sort of fights. <clears throat> Uh, could serial designation N versus absolute solver true form still happen? It could, Mojo Service. It still could. Uh, we'll have to see how that all uh, plays out in the last episode of the season. Uh, Ruben, speaking of fights, uh, my friend has an elite mark on Brazilian jiu-jitsu. And he got wrecked by a girl who I told his leg has been recently broken. You can tell who went to the hospital. <laughs> oh, Oh my, <laughs> why would you do that? Uh, Sam Shorts, prom is a very scary place where anything can happen. Anything can happen. Uh, there could be a queen who has the intention of killing me. I'm out of here. <laughs> hey, but you know what? If the prom queen was V, I would still, I would still personally risk it. Um, I so if my battle scene is anything remotely similar to the end and Nori versus Saul. For Uzi fight, I know I'll be doing something right. Excellent. Jerome says, yeah, uh, do I regret that? No, the girl gave me a kiss on the cheek. I call this an absolute win. You mad lad. And speaking of mad lad, we have the matter lad. Oh, no, I'm late. Don't worry, matter lad. You only missed talking about prom. <laughs> Roblox, LOL, we had a fight today that blocked like half the students on campus. Oh, fantastic. That reminds me of another story, uh, but one that I will not share right now, because uh, for one thing that may get the stream taken down and number two, that would take us a little bit away from uh, <laughs> from the topic at hand. Lars, you're going to summon the V simps. Uh, <laughs> Sam uh, Shorts, I'm scared of V. Save me. Well, we will move on. V will feature in some of the fights for tonight. Uh, as uh, as she definitely does because she is kind of the battle queen of the series. Uh, so, <laughs> women who can kill you that also dig you is a core memory <laughs> win. <laughs> All right. So, let me then talk a little bit about battles. Writing fight sequences. Excuse me. So, when it comes to writing battles, one of the things that that you need to, un so of the many things I guess I should say that you should keep in mind is this. First of all, what is the story that you're actually telling? That's important because if, you, if you're writing a story about drama at a tea party, but, you, but you're, you want everything to be fine, prim, and proper, suddenly having a guy jump in with an Uzi and blast Madame What's-Her-Face out the window uh, in a hail of bullets isn't really going to fit in your story. Neither is it a good idea in a story where maybe people are like, the, you got these street gangs slugging it out, that someone pulls out a lightsaber and begins going swish, swish, swing and, and chopping people up into little bits. Your fights need to make sense within your stories. For that, then, you need to not only understand your story, but you also need to understand your world building. What are the elements that allow you to pull off some of the things that you do? 
Uh, so, for instance, here within Murder Drones, we have a bunch of sentient robots uh, who we have the worker drones who, as we come to learn, don't have much in the way of offensive capabilities, which is why someone like Uzi has to build a gun. We then have N, the disassembly drone, who we see in multiple shots, has all kinds of weapons, a full on arsenal put into his body that can be used in all different kinds of ways. And we even have a scene establishing that even if you blast half of a murder drone away, they can still regenerate their body. Uh, and we learn later on how that's all tied into Absolute Solver, but that's stuff to be discovered down the line. But you want to make sure that for whatever it is that you wish to do within your fights, that you properly set up the world building for what kinds of moves, magic, weapons, whatnot, that characters have that makes the fights work. And then once you've done that, I mean, like, that just sounds like, well, no, duh. You'd be surprised how many creators don't get that right because they just have this cool fight scene in mind and they just insert it, shoehorn it in, smash it down like his will fit. Like uh, like Cinderella's stepsisters trying to cram their feet into one of the little, into, into the glass slipper. It doesn't work that way. Uh, so it needs to make sense. And then... From there, this is then where things really get tricky. And it, it shouldn't be this way, but you'd be surprised how many authors, again, don't get this right. You need to understand why this fight is happening. You then need to actually execute the fight according to the rules that you've established. And then you need to have payoff. You need to have consequences to that fight. Too many people write in these epic fights and then just leave it be. They then don't do anything with it afterwards. Uh, a, a really great example of this actually is George R. Martin. And yes, I will take every opportunity I can to throw George R. Martin under the table. And uh, I will toast to that and take a drink. Mm. There needs to be consequences to your fights. And this is actually where, uh, for instance, we might see some of the issues already cropping up with some of the fights in Murder Drones. Uh, just because I enjoy Murder Drones as a series, I absolutely adore it, doesn't mean that it's above criticism. So, uh, I will say that right here at the onset. And too often, too often, authors try to kind of actually sidestep the whole issue of writing consequences by just always making their heroes win. And as a result of their heroes always winning, they're like, and then the hero gets whatever they want, and I can always have a happy ending and do blah, 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 blah. No, even when characters win in a fight, it can very well be that the consequences are that now they're going to get wrecked in the next one, or that now they have gained enemies that want to come after them later. In my flagship series, The Legend of the Ten Lords, uh, one of the things that the heroes have to learn is actually an old... Uh, an old, basically, proverb of, uh, uh, of, of medieval warfare, of ancient warfare as well, is this. You're at your weakest when you've won because you've expended so much blood, ammunition, and food to, to secure your victory. And if any other prepared army hits you in that moment, you are weak and you can get steamrolled if you're not careful. And that happens at one point to the heroes. They, get, they earn this fantastic victory but then they're weak, they're weakened, and then others can come on through and they just, boom, crash their way on through. So just because you win doesn't mean that everything is all good hunky-dory. <laughs> uh, I see no problem with breaking the canon. Oh, trust me, you do not want to break the canon because people always know the canon of your story. Uh, uh, even if your canon sometimes doesn't make sense. <laughs> all right. So... Um, but 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 then let's talk about the first, like the first real official fight I would say of murder drones. Yes, I know Uzi face down N in uh in the corpse spire, and then there is the confrontation in the hallway. Those are technically two fights, but let's actually talk about the big fight that happens here at the end. So. Uzi, who wants to free the colony, free her colony from the oppression of the murder drones, has built her sick, cool ray gun uh, to, to go wreck some disassembly drones, and has met N, and has <laughs> has befriended N, 
and tries to basically turn N against the other disassembly drones, which doesn't work out all too well because, well, he is what he is. And on top of that, he's got a crush on V, and he's going to do whatever it takes to keep V safe, which takes us to the little bits of betrayal in the hallway, and then with J realizing, oh, V, uh, not V, uh, N is showing uh, tendencies towards uh, disobedience that gives me permission now to kill him. She infects him with a virus that's meant to shut him down, and then Uzi comes and saves him. So that is that is the setup. That is the setup for how we get here. The the other disassembly drones, thanks to N's actions, are now in the colony. The co the doors have been breached, and Khan doesn't have enough time to build a fourth door. the The worker drones are screwed, and it's interesting that Doll isn't showing any of her powers in this episode. Uh, which hmm that I I that's actually something I would say, uh, Liam. I would have actually wanted to see just the tiniest little hint that there might have been something off with one of the other worker drones. So that way, the moment in episode two with Lizzie and Doll, where we get to see them set aside, they'd be like, oh, we're returning to this. What, what's going on here? And then you get that moment where Doll then crushes the little cockroach and splatters all that oil all over her. And you're like, oh. rather than being confused, like, what the heck is going on here? You're like, oh, I knew. Which I knew that there was something wrong with this girl all along. What? Uh, so, in hindsight, that could have been done a little bit better. But here's something I will say. Liam Vickers and company definitely got better with each fight that they did. So, uh, ooh, Roblox gave some, good, uh, gave some good advice. If the cannon is broken, then take the pieces and make a bigger cannon. <laughs> Yes, but if you're going to break canon, you need to have a reason why canon is broken. Otherwise, people of uh, suspension of disbelief. There is actually a really good series that does break what you thought was the canon and then rebuilds it time and time again. That's the Stormlight Archive by Brandon Sanderson. I highly recommend uh, checking that out if, uh, if you want to see someone take their own canon and break it over their knee and do just some amazing battle scenes. Woof. Love the Stormlight Archive. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I just says, personally, I would have Doll's eye flash in the background as Uzi was about to die as if she were about to save her. I like that. I think that's a, I think that, that would be a great little edit to help kind of start tying some things together. Uh, despite N's, as Sam's uh, shorts uh, points out, despite N's unwillingness to kill V, he somehow still won. And that's because, as we see later on, N is just N is N is a beast. N is a monster. He can actually fight when he really, really wants to. And uh, and we, as I said, we will definitely be seeing that a little bit later. Now then, let's actually break down a little bit about the fight right here. Normally, I don't do this where I'm just like, let's take things bit by bit and talk about it. But Resistance. I'm doing it here. Okay. Which one do you want? Jay, please. Too bad. Good luck. <laughs> okay. So, <laughs> one of the re so uh, uh, one of the reasons why I'm going to take this uh, bit by bit. Communication, dialogue in a fight, especially for people who have read too much manga or have watched too much anime, and I could probably include myself in that. It is so tempting to have your characters talking throughout the fight. And I would say this, if you make a magical mechanic that allows your characters to do that, you can do that. But I would say, I would say do the D&D &D rule. Whatever you can say within six to 10 seconds usually would constitute as a good little bit of dialogue or monologue in the middle of a fight because fights are so bombastic. Things just keep on happening. Meaning, uh, you, no one just stands still and is all like, punch, now let me talk. Punch, now let me talk. It doesn't happen that way, and that's actually really boring to read. Uh, so I would not, I would never try to go that route. And you have to do the same thing with thinking. Don't try to cram an entire paragraph's worth of thought, five sentences worth, into just, into like one split second you can describe how multiple conflicting thoughts are happening all at once where characters like oh and just like flailing wildly trying to hold off the enemy that's totally fine i'm totally okay with that 
Uh, <laughs> but it will bog down the pacing of your action. And so what I love here actually in this fight is that the pacing is not screwed up by unneeded dialogue. I know Naruto would disagree with me and so does Dragon Ball. Uh, they can go eat my leftover rice. <laughs> Yes, but they're also very slow uh, anime. All right. So, continuing on. Oh, oh I never want to fight against my crush. And again, here's actually something to consider right here. Why, why would V actually be doing this? There is that clue that V has always known about N and might even like him earlier on in the hallway scene. But then we see this and you're all like, oh, maybe, maybe just my little shipper's heart misunderstood some stuff. Uh, this is an interesting contradictory scene, which where again, if I were in Liam's shoes, I'd be like, how can I, how can I still feel like I'm kind of misdirecting people while still holding true a little bit to V's character and where she's coming from? This is interesting. There, when the moment you start putting emotions into fights, your fights start becoming way more complicated because fighting is about emotion. I've only been in really one real fight where uh, where there was no emotion involved, at least on my part. Ended really fast. Wouldn't even call it a fight. <laughs> Ooh, I, I made a mistake. Pacing, pacing, don't just stand there. See, this is why you don't have a character to simply stand there. I that because you could have shot you could have shot the 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 uh the the, the ray gun. Uh this is one of those things that would take people out of the fight. Uh the music, the emotional attachment that you've that you've now put two characters leading up to this allow you to excuse when characters do dumb things like stand there, point the gun, and then not do anything. So uh again. I wouldn't do this where a character just stands there. I'm like, let me line up my shot. You have a flipping ray gun, Uzi. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, Mike, the voice actor of N makes the ah sounds. Ah, thank you. Uh, he's, he's such a great voice actor. Uh, if you look closely, Solver protects Uzi from the bullets. I'm not sure. I mean, I guess so, since there are some bullets that do kind of wave around. That could have been a little clue. Uh, I will uh, I will defer to Liam about that. And actually, according to that, Isa says right here to give Liam credit. I think the detail of Uzi solver flashing here was a good idea. Damn the well-made quality assured durability of JC Jensen products. So here, good little good good little bit of uh, dialogue to put into the fight, especially because this just fits in so well with Jay's character. I'm being asked to play back. All right, we'll play back. Nope, oh, yep, you're right. I, there it was. The splittest of seconds. Ooh. Now then, that actually, say, for some, because I know some people were, were, just, were talking last live stream about what really activates absolute solver i think this just goes i would argue that absolute solver is always active within the different hosts who may who may have it and that uh and that absolute solver was probably just employed right here to keep her around just because absolute solver needs avatars it needs a host in order to get things moving along i believe that that's going to be one of the things that we see uh, brought up, uh, <clears throat> brought up in the last episode would be my guess. All right, moving on from that. Boom. <laughs> okay, so chaos, chaos in fights is good. Chaos in fights is good. This is something that I see, again, novice authors trying to avoid or either leaning way too into where everything's just chaotic, nothing makes sense. When you do that, it's not fun to read. And when you read a fight that's too clean, where there aren't any mistakes or chaos, 
like it's okay for your character to make a mistake when they're fighting like maybe they swing too wide with their sword maybe they step wrong that kind of stuff is actually engaging to read because then the because then the audience is like oh, did they just make a mistake that might get them killed oh having chaos helps it helps to increase the tension of the scene v had a solid had six solid seconds to fire there yes again slowness as we're going to see as the series progresses liam and company almost completely eliminate the uh the 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 moments of where a character can just stand there and 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 have a chance to monologue or line up a shot and they're protected because of plot armor uh when we get to by the time we get to episode seven it's so fast paced that you're like wait, wait, wait what, what what am i watching <laughs> Oh, he taking her time to shoot. Ah, my mind's in a weird place. Don't read into this. Oh, they definitely read into this. <laughs> and then she's going to miss him. It's one of those things where, like, okay, I guess if I'm going to go back and reinterpret this as a, as a shipper, then yes, okay, the, the feelings were there. He's poking his butt, but she's not actually going out before. And why don't more of the why don't more of these uh, murder drones actually use the EMPs? It's uh, like I mean when we go back to uh, <laughs> when we go back to something like the Matrix. I mean they were wiping out all of the robots with a, with an EMP. Come on, murder drones, get it together. And also, I will bring this up. If you have a weapon that a character can use that's so OP and and can do such devastation, like shutting down an enemy right here, you begin to ask yourself, why don't you use it more? This is where it's good to have some of those little built-in mechanics. Like I said earlier, like know your world, know what works and what doesn't, so that way you can explain why maybe a character doesn't use a doomsday device every other hour of the day. Sword fighting. Now then, for those of you who who uh, who who appreciate uh, back when Chativersity actually did really excellent uh, battle analyses, uh, this is what we call the bind. And I know that Chad hates, absolutely hates it when any story depicts the bind. I actually like the idea of the bind personally because uh for a lot of other people who have ever been in a sword fight being in the bind can actually be a great moment to get a breather and try to either shove the person back or be like okay our swords are locked how do i get out of this because i'm right now i'm right now trapped and you're then and you want to make sure that the other person doesn't try to like swing their sword wide and rip it from your grasp the bind can be an excellent moment of like oh crap i screwed up what do I do now? The I know Shad hates the bind. I personally find that when characters get into the bind, whether it be with guns or with swords or spears, what have you, that's actually a great moment for char for a character to reflect and be like, oh crud, I'm screwed. What do I do? And episode one of Murder Drones gives us a fantastic example of how the bind can be used well. Right here. Oh, he's in the bind. He's got to get his head Uzi! cut off. He sees Uzi's in I'm trouble. So, so sorry. Have fun repressing this. <laughs> yeah. What the hell? Boom. Okay, then. So, right there. Excellent use of the bind, in my humble opinion. <laughs> Iso says, I like it because it's a chance for meaningful conversation. And hey, and got a meaningful little uh, one-liner right there. Have fun repressing this. <laughs> <laughs> Rogue, I've always I was always under the impression that since Jay's that that since Jay's the leader, she's the only one equipped with an EMP uh, to keep catching targets and keep subordinates in line. Rogue, that's actually a fantastic uh, little theory right there, and we'll run with that until we learn otherwise. Uh, Ruben says, should I say the percentage of people in the Brazilian community that consider sin? uh to like n more more than a brother yeesh our literature has a fixation with uh you know the word you know it's funny uh rubens that you bring this on up because i get so much flack 
for for saying that there is a little bit of like not like not that sin is is i would say in love with n but sin has a relationship with n and there's so many people online who are all like no no there is no relationship i'm like guys just because they are consent because sin considers them brother and sister does not mean that sin wants to have all kinds of lovely sparks between her and n or that she wants to try out his vibrating function no that is not what it means <laughs> <laughs> but too many people just do not want to admit that there is any sort of relationship and relationships can be platonic between N and Sin. Uh, Space Galax, my friend said why they give them tongues. Uh, said why they give them tongues. Uh, the reason why, why, why do they have tongues? So that way they can have saliva. Because uh, their saliva, for whatever reason, heals them. And I think that's just Liam being funny. Uh, and also because the robots, the drones, are supposed to basically be inserts for humans, while the humans are all fuzzy, dark, whatnot, with glowing eyes. Uh, and so that way you actually identify more with the robots because of their more humanistic qualities than with the weird shadow humans. Uh, Amazing Gamer brings up something that I was going to bring up. Thank you, Gamer, for doing this. So N kicks V to help Uzi, then doesn't help Uzi for the 30-odd seconds we spend almost watching her lose. Exactly. And that is something that they definitely that they definitely missed out on right here. If, if N has just solidly beaten V, why doesn't he come and tackle J? This would actually be amazing where he tackles J. He gets a good punch in for revenge. She then beats him, and then Uzi has to step in to save N. That would have been really good to see, but no, we don't get it. Uh, so <laughs> don't question why we like this, though. Oh boy, I will question Rubens, but not here on not, not here on the live stream. Uh, Jay gets killed by her monologue. It just proves Liam knew knew what he was doing. Yes, you caught me monologuing, you fly dog. <laughs> One of the best quotes. Of, You've uh, got a lot of guts uh, uh, for a barely sentient any superhero. I've had uh, great fight back before, but sure, edgy. Best monologue ever. <laughs> Spirit is just so painful. I love how often the the thing that was going to come back into play throughout the series. One more buzzword, and I'll do it. Ah, uh, yes, thank And it is done. <laughs> so, when, when we look at it right here, uh, this fight, that this fight is timed at less than three minutes. And that's really good. I will say this. I am one of the weird ones who likes writing long fights. I love long fights and battles. But I know that that's not necessarily for everyone. And so that's also something to kind of uh, to kind of consider for your for your uh, story. Does your story require long fights or sh short fights? And uh, and again, I just really like writing long fights. However, I've come to appreciate that short fights definitely keep people probably way more engaged than really long battles. And this fight right here, which Rubens uh, earlier actually on our uh community post said i believe was number two on your list of your absolute favorites based on on your own criteria and this fight is definitely one that remains in a lot of people's it remains really high on people's lists of like the best conflicts within murder drones and it's because it's a solid fight even with its problems it does have problems but it's a pretty solid fight and it doesn't last very long at all. So you're not actually there just like be like, when is this going to end now? You're not given too long to question the silliness that is playing out in front of you. So uh, let's have a quick uh, look right here. Uh, no equality partnership. Rubens, should I be proud of my nation's literature being used to analyze the psychology behind brother sister love bonding or question why it happened? Both. I like trope i like tropes i guessing is what you're saying trophiums lol uh mibook says and the name sin sounds like the word sin which is really interesting and i would and uh, she was referred to as antichrist by tessa's mom which made me laugh i don't think that was done coincidentally yeah no uh and that actually comes in mibook uh to 
uh, to the apocalyptic horror of the previous episode, episode seven, which is all about like God being defeated by greater demons, earth being a, and into absolute evil so sin being referred to as the antichrist being absolutely evil and all of that fell fell in perfectly in line with the post-apocalyptic or i should not have the post-apocalyptic but the apocalyptic horror storytelling that was being homaged to is being honored in the latest episodes that is definitely a very good observation sam says i'm not a long fighter and that's totally fine I mean, I love long fights, but again, I know that isn't necessarily for everyone. And uh, we will get to the second fight here real quick, but let me uh, quickly have a look at uh, what else is being said right here. I used to think it was the best fight in the series, but looking back, yeah, it is heavily flawed. It was their first, so I see why it was given a little leeway. Still far from perfect. Yes. And here's the thing. Liam, again, he and his crew were absolutely learning as they went. Episodes one and two do have like engaging fights, but you can see that there's so many problems with them. After that, they got really smart. And I, I really hope to prove that, especially with, ep with episodes four, five, and six. Because their fight scenes are perfect for what they were doing. And uh, I just, I love them so much. Right, so for me, the last, uh, the fight lasts as long as it lasts. I don't mind its length, but I prefer reading longer fight scenes. Rogue, I can see why N took a second to help Uzi. He probably had to finish up tying V so she wouldn't shoot him or Uzi from behind, like with Dahl. And that's a good point. Like, we don't see V being absolutely incapacitated. And she is tied up later on. So he probably was busy. But yeah, he didn't immediately fly in to save her from Jay. And we can quibble about that. I, I don't think that I, I don't think that that it's above reproach to question, well, why didn't he? Uh, Rubens, uh, doesn't Apocalypse uh, also mention a prelude to the disasters that would follow the gala uh, shenanigans? Could be it. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, and <laughs> no Apocalypse is without its uh, without its wind up. Uh, <laughs> Spam says, I, I'd like to say that sin just rubs me the wrong way, dot, dot, dot. We'll leave it at that. <laughs> uh, uh. Sam says, no, going back to episode one and two, there are so many animation flaws in the fights. Yeah, there's definitely clunkiness, uh, to, to be sure. Uh, Amazing Gamer says, actually, yeah, Rogue, that's a good observation. Chloe sins so real, to be honest. She's a silly gal. She's a silly gal who just wants to end the universe. You know, just like your next door neighbor's girl. Absolutely. We all know someone like that. <laughs> so now to set up um, our, uh, our next... Uh, our, our next uh our next fight right here this is in the second this is in the sec this is from the second episode this is when we first get to see absolute solver and we don't fully know what we're seeing right here this is as far as anyone knows this is spooky uh snag crab snake crab j uh because this is jay's corpse being reassembled using absolute solver it's a mystery here's the thing uh, here's the thing that that, that we'll that, that we'll talk about once we've seen the fight entirely. Again, a fight should complement the story. When you look at episode two of Murder Drones, there is definitely an alien vibe to it. What the movie Alien, with uh, with how with how you have these victims who are being just picked off one by one in gruesome ways. This monster that just seems to be evolving from a small thing, and no one really knows what's happening. Alien was definitely an inspiration for uh, episode two. Alien works best when the fights between the humans and Alien, between them and the Xenomorph, are kept sweet and simple, realistic, and where the humans are absolutely outmatched by the Xenomorph, and they have to use their cunning and the environment to try to defeat the xenomorph when it just comes down to pew 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 lasers big kabooms it ma it makes ale it makes the xenomorphs seem silly like why why did why did it take you guys so long to deal with these guys i mean they just go kaboom and you just stay back far enough away so we don't get splashed with acid i don't see what the big deal is and that is and that is where i hope to show that while this fight is engaging and actually gives us a lot of information it might not have been the right kind of fight 
for the episode that we got because the episode that we got was definitely very seeped in cosmic horror it was meant to be slow it was a pretty slow episode and that's okay because we want to build up the tension in the horror and then boom action and the action came right after we even got some of the best stuff so like right before this even happens and just shot a rocket up into nothing and then you see the big contorted body of snake of a uh, spooky snake crab jay and then this happens and yes rogue it definitely the thing the thing plays throughout the entire uh show uh, you good uh, stop asking chainsaw hand time yeah cool Again, the dialogue sweet and simple, just the way you want it. Humans. Yes, and hello. It's <laughs> now then. This is where the rule of mo the, of dialogue kind of gets broken. And if you know, and here's and here's and this actually comes back to something that Roblox said way earlier on. You break the cannon to build a bigger cannon. If you know the rules, you also then know how to break the rules and get away with it. There are times where you can break the rule of dialogue and actually have it long to either set up a comedic effect or to set up something awful to happen. And we actually get both comedic and awful in this same fight as absolute, as absolute solver monologues to Uzi. It's me, Ted. Um, can I get a location? <laughs> I heard dentist office. I'm sat at the dentist office. Come over here. I'm sat at the dentist office. Predictably terrible work, Jay. Why do you look so great? You look great, Jay. <laughs> no, no, wait, guys. It's really me. It's really me. Wait, no, it's like again, kind of actually like thinking about how. How sin slash absolute solver uh, always always is able to like pull the wool over people's eyes. It's always interesting to see that in some cases the illusions are like super spot on, and other times it's just nonsense like this. And that's one of the reasons why I I have my theory that absolute solver when it consumes its victims that it keeps part of them around. Because since it didn't actually kill Thad, it doesn't know how to properly like replicate Thad. Didn't even really spend some. Didn't spend any time getting to know Thad. So as a result, this is an awful, an awful imitation of Thad. And how dare you do an awful imitation of Best Boy or second Best Boy, I should say. <laughs> is that a battle for like ninja star? You get Scream's voice. And there comes Dad. My savers again. Thanks. Super invited to my shindig next weekend. Cool kids only. Why didn't we ever get the shindig? I really wanted the shindig. We needed to get the shindig. Someone write a fanfic about Thad's shindig. Because we need it. <laughs> Michael Lewin saying, and disappearing in the scene. You know, always has bothered me. Yes, that is a that is a mistake. Uh, it, it just it doesn't work very well. What's with the voice, Jay? Oh, and then there we have. We are trying to repair Jay's not here, but but we do get a little bit of Jay's personality shining through. Creepy What's with the mom hologram? Easier to assimilate. Amazing Gamer says the problem would have been the perfect setup to be the shindig. Yes, the shindig. Real, Chloe, real shindig when? I know, I want the shindig. Uh, one of these days when I when I actually have a little bit more time on my hands, wouldn't that be nice? What is that going to be like? I might try writing a, uh, a, 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 a fan fiction where we actually get Thad's shindig. Because I think that would be absolutely amazing. Uh, Roblox, not going to lie, Jay calling the drones barely sentient toasters was totally true in watching this episode. <laughs> yep. <laughs> it's so true. Not happening. Fair, but poor choice. Now we will have to do something shocking. So here's the thing. This is actually great horror. This is good horror to have right here. And then it just starts going too much kaboom and maybe that's just my uh, my taste and aesthetic 
Uh, but uh, but we go but we go from cosmic horror to things just going kaboom really fast and not making a whole lot of sense. This fight actually makes excellent sense in hindsight, but without the hindsight, if you were just to look at this fight on its own, it doesn't work as well as it might first land. Whoa. Hey! Goodbye, Dad. Goodbye, Dad. Yeah, say excellent horror in this particular what? episode, like this right here. And then boom. And yeah, sure, at this point it's all it's it all starts becoming an, an illusion. But it it, it just it's killing because like, okay, where is N in all of this? No. And then also we've seen that N is very capable. Why why I couldn't he take her on out and also easy why didn't you just use the rape? Again, lots of things about this fight then start becoming a little bit just yeah, too much. Like and where were And also I was using those. <laughs> I love that. I was, I was using those. Kaboom. And and so there we have the ending. And 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 here's what and here's what I'm gonna say. Again, so the, the setup like the setup actually works out really well. Why they're here with that saying that they gotta come, people are disappearing, uh Jay's body has begun moving again, so we gotta put a stop to that. All of that is really good. Like how we got here works perfect. The opening, good spookiness. Ah, oh, the creepiness of this episode is on point. And then it just all starts going kaboom. And with and here and here's then where like consequences for fights begins going out the window. Remember that Uzi exiled herself at the end of episode one. At the end of this episode, she's back in the colony. No harm, no foul. Everyone's moving on. And now she and N are separated because she doesn't trust N. And yeah, that kind of makes a little bit sense. But until then, the next episode, they're back to being great pals and working perfectly in tandem with each other to fight against Dahl. The consequences of episodes one and two's battles start growing rather shaky. Episode three on, the consequences of each battle stick. And that is important. Because the consequences of a battle, especially of a battle in which people die, the consequences need to be real and they need to stick. Even in a world where characters can come back to life and then characters can come back to life here in Murder Drones, Jay comes back. But the absence of Jay and the trust that N and V have towards Jay leads it to that when she does return, they are then primed to be taken advantage of by Sin when she's masquerading as Tessa. So it actually works out really well. That's a good, long-lasting consequence. But when when Uzi's fate just happens to juggle around from episode to episode until we finally know what we're going to do with her, it doesn't seem as though these fights really matter too much to her beyond her psyche. And I, I hope that my explanation there makes a little bit of sense. Like, where it seems like everything is tied to her psyche. And then in episode three, we see her going la di da da pulling down posters. And other than losing N, she's ready to be back in the game. It just feels incons inconsistent. And yes, it's being used for comedic purposes, but you can actually still be funny without sacrificing the consequences of your fights. Uh... Ace, uh, Ace Attorney fan does point out that we do lose the railgun, and that is true. We do lose the railgun until Khan is like, "Here, I made a, I made like the, uh, the the cricket version of it, the little tiny handgun, and it's going to be awesome." Uh, so yes, that is true. Uzi does lo lose a very powerful weapon, and that is a good consequence that does stick uh, throughout the series. So that that I will definitely give it that. Um, amazing gamer says, looking back, it really feels like the railgun was destroyed just so Uzi always has to rely on N from now on. Uh, from a writing perspective, yes, and I don't exactly like that. It does work out for them working out, working together in episode three, but again, because they then split on up, why is it that they're able to work so well in tandem in episode three? Yes, they're best friends, but again, but it, it's just it's one of those moments where you're like, 
the suspension of disbelief. Like I can suspend my disbelief and enjoy and enjoy the third episode. And I really do. It's one of my favorite episodes. But if I stop to be critical as an author, that is then where the suspension of disbelief starts falling apart. And I have to find excuses to keep it together. And that's not okay. You don't want that to happen with your audience. It also encourages her to rely on using solar powers in dangerous situations. That is true, but she doesn't really start worrying too much about Absolute Solver until uh, until she begins to start freaking out, like, with what the heck is going on here. More so in Episode 4. Episode 3 kind of, in, like, this, and this is actually where people really complained about the pacing issues earlier on. Like, I remember when I was doing my initial reviews for Episodes 3, 4, and 5, and people were complaining about all the pacing issues. And definitely, in retrospect, you can see where the pacing issues come in, because it seems like Uzi is just gaining power-ups and learning to master them way too fast uh so yeah if we in a perfect world where glitch had the where glitch would have the money for at least 10 episodes if not 20 episodes all of this could easily be rectified but we live in a world where we only get eight episodes of murder drones so all right uh moving uh, moving on then over to uh episode three uh, so yeah, the consequences should stick. Um, you can write battles where consequences don't stick as, as much. And, and that's, and that's okay. But I would relegate that to smaller fights where either like you're using an action scene to introduce a character or an action scene to kind of establish something. Then you don't have to worry too much about the consequences, but it's always really great when we have the consequences that last for a while. Uh, that makes the fight feel more real, feel like the stakes actually mattered, and it helps to contextualize and place the fight better within the story. And honestly, people remember battles that actually have real consequences to them as opposed to just fantastic action. And I've seen this play out in other discussions that people have had. Now then, we come to the prom episode, the promening. The setup for this particular one, and this is actually where the action works out really, really well, because this has been a very bombastic episode with all kinds of crazy things happening with Absolute Solver now rearing its ugly head firmly within Uzi. Weird shenanigans are going on. Doll has been revealed to be a to, to be a murderer who is killing off all of these other uh, female drones in the colony. Uh, v is on the loose. So, of course, we can now expect anything to happen, and it's a prom episode. So we expect it to be just over the top. And Chloe says this episode is the second best fight scene, in my opinion. Chloe, I, I think I'd have to agree with you. In terms of, like, good, solid fight sequences, this is my second favorite. Uh, because, uh, because even though the consequences were kind of shaky leading up to this, N and Uzi working together against Doll just works so fantastically well and a lot of like the slower moments that were rather clanky in episodes one and two are gone and this fight firmly fits uh with what we see and spam says she had to trust her anime pirating skills absolutely we see a lot of great anime callbacks uh coming to uh coming out in this particular episode can we get uh we can get into seven we were going to get we were going to get to episode seven eventually we are going to get there uh me book says i really hope miss doll will come back i feel like her character arc was sort of cut short we agree considering uzi's mom was still alive hopefully doll has to come back too she definitely deserves better there is a chance after her being consumed by absolute solver that she is still alive within the solver we're just going to see what happens so let's uh so uh, so our setup is that doll has this actually really cool plan set up for uh, Lizzie to befriend V, get V to the prom, while Doll kills off all the other competition, so that way there's only one person who could possibly become a uh, prom queen, and then when she stands on the X, X marks the spot, Doll will then crucify her and then kill her for killing her family. So, uh, so there we have it. Does episode 5 even have a fight, Spam X? It does? And I'm going to show it to you. And I actually really, really like how that fight works out. Uh, so let's get into the next one. Unhand oh. them, you fiend. I love that line right 
quick there. I don't know how many of you have ever watched uh, the cartoon, the Dober Brothers from Warner Brothers way back in the day. If you haven't, it's hilarious. There's a part where uh, where one of the cartoon characters uh, is trying is trying to address the villain, but keeps on saying something to someone else. And it's just like, unhand her damn backslide! Unhand her damn backslide! Unhand her damn backslide! Hey, we're getting into a rut. Uh, that just... that. That moment right there with with uh, Uzi reminded me of that, and that's quality com comedy. <laughs> uh, let's see. Roblox says, "I think this episode also gives us the explanation how V lost to N, other than her not trying because she was bad in this episode when she had no reason to hold back." And Roblox, I think you might have a point right there. Uh, v it, V is a good fighter. She's a good huntress. But V can be overpowered. And I think one of the things is that V is so used to just killing people really, really fast that when anyone can actually put up a fight against her, she's not used to actually being in a prolonged fight. Uh, and that's something that you can observe in all different kinds of contests for fencers, boxers, wrestlers. There are those who go for the quick victories. And if they get pulled into a long slog, they just get defeated. Uh, because they because they don't have the endurance and the skill uh, to go with that endurance. Uh, then Lizzie say V because she was harder than Doll. Yes, yes she did. Uh, and Lizzie has her priorities. Hey, has been hotel exorcist vibes. Uh, definitely carry vibes going on. I'm confused. Here. On second thought, you're way harder than Doll. Run, idiot! Yep, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there it goes. I like a doll. At least doll was saving her friend. And, except for that one. And then we get full on carry uh, going right here. Now then, this is again where the where breaking the rules of dialogue and monologue works out really well. Uh, this was very good. This is Liam blending the two together with the with the forced memories and then the chat from doll. Uh, that was good. And then we get this sick moment where you get to see Absolute Solver just being perfectly utilized by Doll to uh, to wreck V, and and yeah, it's just good. Did it all? I guess we should. Uh, uh... <laughs> I guess we should help. Ah, ah good old man. All right. Now then, a uh, little. Now then, here. Now then, here is something uh, to talk about. Like, let's let, let's let, let's just consider this episode by itself. Not talking about what we've now all learned about Absolute Solver. I remember when this episode dropped, and I was doing the breakdown of the fight, and talking about how these powers are being used. And at that time, we didn't realize that Absolute Solver is the entity itself. I just thought it was the the code that unlocked all of these abilities that it has. And what I and what I said is that what I said there is that we have learned from absolute so we've learned from all these different scenes with absolute solver. The absolute solver grants all of these different kinds of powers. And so we actually do so what, what everything that doll begins to do in this episode makes sense because even though absolute solver has not yet been explained to us we have seen absolute solver in action so all of doll's actions make sense it doesn't feel like it's breaking the world or breaking canon and that's really good uh thanks to brand if there's any one drawback from brandon sanderson's hard magic systems that have become way more popular it's that too many authors want to completely over explain everything that they're doing within a scene if you've ever read shadow of the conqueror by shad brooks he over explains how a character can leap from building to building i don't care tell me that a character has magic and that allows them to leap from building to building and that is awesome if you want to describe how magic works and why magic works and what you can do with it do it outside of the fight don't do it in the middle of the fight that slows everything down liam vickers and crew did an amazing job of setting up absolute solver just enough for us to understand what it could do what it could possibly do in order to have this epic fight scene and from here we get to see just everything cut loose 
properly. Han, you need to build better doors in the future. And this is actually a good little monologue moment right here. Yes, they're still talking, but this makes sense. Doll, Doll wants to understand what the heck is going on right here. She doesn't yet know we about Uzi and Absolute together, Solver, not at all. but it works. Especially with how Doll God responds. Mila. Cute. I don't need help. Boom! There she goes. And now from this point on, it is all action. And being the good boy doing the right thing. Yes, be cut, be sliced up into pieces for your best friend. The creepiness. <laughs> <laughs> Sam has like her questioning why she teams up with murder drones. Well, uh, Doll is trying to use Tessa and Jay. Uzi is very clearly working together with N to save V, and that doesn't make any sense to her. Here comes the knife. Catch the knife. Pull out the knife. Don't actually do that. You will bleed out way more than if you kept the knife in there. And then boom. Boom. Absolute solver strains working on out. And I love how you get to see. I love how you get to see Doll begin to freak out because she's been relying on her powers to do all these things, and now the tables are getting turned. She can still win, but now she can't just simply overpower her enemy. She's in the stuck in the same position that V begins to find herself in. Uh, I'm done with dealing with everything alone. So you'll refuse to help from your father who's finally trying to help you, but accept it from men who the last time you saw him where you were horrified of what he is. Uh, yes, teenage logic. Amazing gamer. Teenage logic. <laughs> All right. Aww. Is this... Ew. You look like garbage. You freaking traitor! As if you were <laughs> using me to try and kill everyone, Miss Petty. Where does this freaking go? Thank you, Lizzie! Shut, Shut up, loser. loser. Oof. Now then, again, conversations during a fight. This conversation, I don't ding, because it helps to establish, again, character. And plus, also, they're not the ones currently fighting. Uh, Uzi and Doll are the ones who are throwing around knives and stuff. So that all makes sense. Uh, <laughs> still, no questions like about like object doll. Uh, well, doll does go kind of on a on a journey of discovery after this. Rogue doll's absolute solver is absolutely affecting her in the same manner like Uzi, just didn't manifest the, the wings. Hence the eye patch after she got shot. Uh, dang, doll really died twice. Yes, yes, she did. Or, or the. <laughs> Doll. Again, I did. I I love. I like. I, I like how this all just plays out. Then boom. Again, doll being very smart. You're like, okay, if I can't just simply overwhelm you, you know, simply you can create more knives and block you right there. Uh, and coming on in. Me. And then the iconic little dance scene. And the music works. Like. It's just, it's fantastic. Kudos. Kudos to the entire team for making this entire scene just work out so well. The music is in time with the spins. You even get the, even have like the, even have the short rest right when the characters come to rest as well. The music complements every little bit of movement. There are, there are movie critics out there who complain that movies are completely uninspired these days and there's no good action. Show them this scene and they might be really good confused but it flipping works <laughs> doll used unlimited blades it works effectively uh, uh roblox theory n is good at combat because while j and v only fought helpless workers n had to survive them oof roblox that is beautiful that is beautiful and that is painful at the same time <laughs> quit saving me you'd have died if you didn't you dummy Again, she's an angsty teen. Uh, I, I will let that slide. It might annoy you, but I'll let it slide. <laughs> Seriously. Moment. Don't do that again. And this right Let's here see. for me. I, okay. Then. For all the shippers in the room, this is the moment where I think that Ed, where Uzi actually started liking N. Or I should say, is the it, this is the impetus for that. That they were all pretty friends. Friendship makes friendship is all totally fine. Love a good friend, 
but then seeing how far he would go for her and no one else has done that in her life as as far as at least as far as we know yeah sure that's going to make that's going to make her start falling for him so i totally get that i i if i if i were if i were to if i were to fully analyze and break down the newsy ship newsy begins here the friendship began back in episode 1 romance begins here hey, you're done. Here you go. <laughs> oh, I love this. I love watching Doll just go full Emperor Palpatine do Chucky stuff. Anim pirated anime skills coming to use. Gives builds up. You wounded me. Wow. This is the first time any did you Uzi. Yep. Boom. Oh. Perfect. So in line with with V. V, we needed her for answers. What? She's fine. Uh, uh a little tuckered out. <laughs> a little tuckered out, you think? All right. So <laughs> the consequence. So let's talk about the consequences for this fight. This. Well, let me actually let's first wind. Let me rewind a little bit. This fight, in my opinion, was executed very, very well. What we knew made sense, sure. In hindsight, we know way more about what's going on here. But even without hindsight, this fight still works. Everything was set up in terms of the plot, in terms of Absolute Solver's powers, and the relationships that bring everyone there. N is coming to save V. That, uh, that, that's what he's doing. And helping out Uzi is just a big bonus. Uzi is going to start falling for end here by the end of this episode because of what they go through together doll is out for revenge she set all of that up everything is actually working out wonderfully and just the choreography and the music the animation the budget went up for all of this everything is just working out really really well so uh, like all of the pieces for what you want in a good fight uh, has all come together one of the reasons though why this fight sticks so well in people's minds is is i would say because of where we go from here because now we've got all of this tension we got all of this mystery doll doll cheats death uh uzi now has a mystery to solve which is immediately going to take us on over into episode four and and uh and it, this just feels like it feels like everyone has fin has finally like gone somewhere we see character development for v we see character development for n we see character development for uzi that can all be attached to this fight this fight has everything that you want in a good battle with the proper setup the proper execution and the proper payoff and consequences with long lasting consequences that take us not just into episode four but into episode five and even into episode six where V and N are concerned. And also, again, talking Uzi, or I say talking new Uzi, because this is kind of the impetus, this is where it begins. Yeah, long-reaching consequences all from this fight. That is what you want. And Liam, he did a great job. Uh, -da -ba -da. Okay, so let's then hop on over to fight number four. Now then, let us establish what exactly we've got going on with episode with the fourth episode. So the fourth episode is a horror homage to uh teen, to the teens in the woods. You can think of everything uh, from Friday the Thirteenth to Nightmare on Elm Street uh, to uh, Halloween, and then of course all of the B B movie knockoffs uh, from that. Teens in the woods. Horror is going to happen. Shenanigans ensue. Uh, the teens who go, go off to Boink are the first ones to get killed. Uh, I love watching the second movie to Friday the 13th because of how all the teens who go off to get Boink get murdered. <laughs> I could not stop laughing. <laughs> so that's what we get here. However, even though there are some good laughs in episode four, episode four is way more about the horror. And it fits. And here's the thing is that as Uzi starts transforming into the Eldritch Gargoyle Uzi form, as Absolute Solver begins to take hold uh, over her, uh, well, like, even though everything is primed for a good, just good slog between Eldritch uh, Uzi and, and the Disassembly drones, that's not what we get. 
we actually get a very fast-paced monster fight where the monster is completely manhandling everything that is going like manhandles uh v no problem whatsoever the only thing that i will say right now before we get into it that i don't like even though it's hilarious and so i will give it a pass for it being funny but it ultimately doesn't work is that n can just chuck uzi into the stratosphere like yes it's funny i get it and it sets up that 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 nice that 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 nice uh emotional moment between the two of them but if n has that much power behind his throwing arm this guy should be able to pick up absolute solver itself and chuck it into a proper black hole <laughs> so i i will contest that it's one of, the, one of those moments where when you stop to think about it what's actually happening uh it's um the, the suspension of disbelief falters somewhat but that's really my only strike against this fight because it is so well set up with how Uzi's turning into a monster, her going on her monstrous rampage, and then what we see between her and V. And goes JoJo and launches Solver into the sun. Yes. Yes, I want that. I also want N to I also want to see N uh dance some JoJo's dances. N is built literally built different. That is true. You are absolutely right, Roblox. <laughs> Bro, N is god at every sport. <laughs> <laughs> yeah we're, i'm just waiting for doggo n because then he's just goes like that's going to be beyond super saiyan so here we go with with the fights we have to have creepy setup oh, thank robo god final girl final girl <laughs> whoopsies <laughs> Eldritch Uzi and all of her and all of her abomination glory. And then I love how Lizzie responds. Um, flashing? And then chokes and caught. Here she comes. V for the win. Killing her, not saving you. Okay, Mom. <laughs> So great, great, great dialogue. New body, same horrors. Huh, Sin? And that right there, that 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 little bit of dialogue to prime us for episode five. Ah, oh, that's a chef's kiss bit of dialogue right there. There's some moments in some of my own books where I've written characters who like give like a little bit of dialogue or a small monologue that makes a reference to something else. Whereas the author, you know, like. In one or two books, this is all going to become relevant and people have no idea what they've just read. <laughs> oh, just the power that flows through you at that point. Hannah Heaven, now she is the final girl. <laughs> Oof, it's absolutely true. Actually, it gets better in episode seven, but I have a gripe about that. Oh, I'll be interested in seeing what your gripe is, uh, Roblox. The slow walks refusing, the slow walking refusing to let her live. Uh, the slow walk of someone who is who is contemplating get finally getting their revenge. This is why I really hope that V truly is alive, as, as it's been hinted at, because I need to know what actually happened with V. Did V happen to retain all the memories of everything that happened? Because if so, she has good reason to have that slow walk of revenge, where she is going to, she, she wants to save her killing sin. That is what this is all about. I don't know who that is. Can I talk to Anna? I'll make sure you can't. And that's a moment right there where, uh, so Spam says, I don't think this is Sin, though. I like, I contend that it is. Like, I can understand that Uzi would be the one, like, that Uzi would want to talk to N. N isn't present at all. And, I, and she is aware enough that she knows that N isn't around. Yes, no yellow eyes. But I think that a little bit of sin is slipping through in that moment. That would be my guess. Is she completely possessed? No. But I do believe that we got a little bit of sin that was seeped through right then and there. And that's another reason why V is just ticked right here. Because that's her man. And she is going to kill the, uh, the, the little imp that started off all that started off their long parade of nightmares. 
And then boom. But yeah, again, it, when 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 V oh. when V gets uh, when V is off her game, he doesn't lose damage chance. I just love the creepy way that Eldritch Uzi moves in this whole scene. Whoops! Easy there, buddy. Ha! <laughs> Ow! Up we go. And there we are. And that <laughs> so there, so so there, there we have it. Every time Uzi Solver glitches out, flashes yellow. All right. So let's talk about the consequences of the of this particular of this particular fight. And yes, I saw some people uh, mentioning that there are some animation errors. There are always going to be a few animation errors here and there about some details missing in the background. That's what's what's gonna that's what's gonna happen. N should go football. In fact, well, here's the thing, actually why I'd say N should go baseball. He would destroy uh, in a in a baseball tournament. But let's talk con let's talk consequences uh, for this particular fight. Like episode four overall has major implications for stuff moving forward. Episode five, like when we think about what what kinds of consequences are lingering on over from. Uh, from episode four, I think that it begins to make a little bit more sense why V begins to let go of, of N because N clearly is saving Uzi, which V doesn't like that at all, but also she's not as capable or as strong as she once thought that she was. She can't actually save N anymore. She was the one who needed saving. And so this is messing with V. Like, who is she? What should she do? And we can see that conflict playing about her face and in the background for episode for really episode six. That's really where it starts to come in, uh, come in a whole lot for Uzi. It's interesting because like this is something where she should be horrified of what she's able to do. But she immediately uses Absolute Solver now whenever she can. Uh, that's something that we could quibble and say is an inconsistency. I think though that really does fit her personality and how she how she uh, how she's always acted. She's always done her own thing. She's always seen herself as the renegade, as the outlaw. Uh so so sure, she would continue to use absolute solver. This fight in terms of the other battles is definitely not a big one in terms of the action or of its major lasting consequences other than what we see happening with V and Uzi's more permanent transformations thanks to Absolute Solver. And we definitely see how Absolute Solver does have way more presence within her, which does set up the betrayal, not so much in Episode 6. Like, we do see Absolute Solver doing all kinds of wonky things in Episode 6, but I would argue more for Episode 7, when as she begins to use Absolute Solver against Tessa, Absolute Solver begins restraining her despite what she tries to do. And, and so that's what I would say is kind of like a little bit of a foreshadowing that we get from this particular fight. So from what we've got uh, right here, Hannah says she's now a murder drone. Uh, Samp, give N 10 brain cells and we will destroy 10 brain cells and we will destroy uh, the amazing gamer. Okay. I want to address this. Sin was indeed in control of Uzi during the Uzi versus V fight there. So of course she knew how to use the, the solver power. So how does Uzi know how to use it so freely in episode five? Again, this comes down to pacing. We're missing way more, way more scenes. And I'd say like people would call this filler. I wouldn't say filler. Uh, slice of life moments for a story where you just get to see characters being themselves without major plot implications can be some of the most rewarding stuff to help make sense of bigger fight scenes or bigger reveals or bigger character moments later on, but that's that's often overlooked by authors and by fans. There are some amazing episodes of various shows that people describe as filler, and they're not. I hate it when I hear people talking about how like half of the episodes of Amphibia are filler. No, every episode of Amphibia is essential to building up everything that happens in that series. If you remove any of the Slice of Life episodes, you ruin some of the best character moments in the last season. And, uh, and, and, and so that's when a story is written 
really well. If a story can use the slice of life moments and the downtime to really build up characters and help set things up, you can do amazing things, and then your bigger moments make more sense. Murder Drones, with its limited budget, cannot do everything that a longer story should and could, which is why it feels like we're making massive leaps with Uzi being able to use Absolute Solver way more than she normally should. So The Amazing Gamer, you make an excellent point right there. The only thing that we have to just, again, consider is what, is what Glitch Productions is working with. And when we realize what their limitations are, as opposed to maybe authors who have a chance to write a whole book, that's when you need to realize downtime is important, transitions are important, and characters need to learn how to do stuff in order to make sense of things later on. I have the time. I can do that. I am not limited by the budget constraints that Glitch has to work with. And, and so when a, a, writer does, a writer shouldn't have that excuse. Just my opinion. Uh, Mibuk uh, says the apocalypse happens and everybody dies and gets destroyed. Oof, how sad. But Lizzie will forever be indestructible and still texting like it's a Tuesday. <laughs> spoilers, spoilers for episode eight. Uh, the, the Amazing Gamer, uh, learning off screen is not an excuse. That's just lazy writing. And again, I would agree. I do agree. The only thing is, is again, budget constraints. And, uh, and, and when you're, when you talk to someone who has to deal with the budget constraints for what they can and can't do, that's where they then have to say, there are things that just have to get sacrificed. If you're writing a book, yeah, you don't have much of an excuse to do that. Especially if you're writing a series of books, you got to show all that stuff going down. Otherwise, otherwise you're just being lazy. But for a show that has got limited resources and limited runtime, I'm going to say that while I don't like it, and believe you me, during my reviews and analyses for these earlier episodes, I brought that up and I discussed that with people. But looking at everything now, like I can say, yeah, I, we got what we got and I really like what we got, but other creators don't try to do this unless you're operating under the same restrictions. Uh, ba -ba -da -ba -da. Besides my theory about how Eldritch V was the monster in episode seven. Hmm. Uh, okay, so here we then get going. So let's get to episode five. We got ourselves a murder robo child, Jay. How do you reckon we murder as a robo child, Jay? <laughs> <laughs> All right, so the lead up to this particular fight, like, there isn't much violence. I mean, there's plenty of violence in episode five, but as far as an actual fight goes, other than the tug of war for the little cockroach, uh, the the only fight is what we get right here. Mm. I had to take a drink of water. All right, so in order to set up this fight, Sin has been revealed to be the monstrosity that is that is causing all these problems. We learned that V had completely shut down, and many of the other worker drones have been corrupted. And turned into Eldritch Abominations. And Sin is using V specifically to hunt after N and the others. And as we learn later on, as it's basically confirmed in Episode 7, Sin does this because she enjoys torturing these people. She knows that N loves V and that V loves N, and so she has turned one of them into a monster to hunt the other one because that's fun and it hurts them both. Oh, isn't that just so Sin-like? <laughs> <laughs> so Eldritch Abomination Sin is on the loose in these in these replicated memories that N and V share. And Uzi is trying to help N understand what's going on within these memories as a means of being able to save N and V from whatever is trying to hack their minds and delete these memories as they begin to bubble on up to the surface. Uh, Mibu says, you just gained yourself a brand new subscriber, Mr. Camille. Thank you. I am not Camille. I am Lars. Uh, but Camille appreciates it just the just all the same. Uh, thank you, Mibuk. <clears throat> so we have that going on. Tessa and and Jay have uh, have come to realize, oh crud, Sin is an absolute abomination. Who's going to kill everyone in the gala? We are going to break loose. They break loose, and they're trying to figure out how they can kill Sin in order to prevent the massacre from happening. So we've got Uzi and N being meta, trying to survive the dream and preserve the memories meanwhile you have the people within the dream within the memories who are just trying to survive the gala as we learn later on 
no one survived uh, other than Tessa, who very likely did survive, survive so that way uh, <laughs> Jade, uh, not Jade, that way Sin could come back later on and, and torture her. Yay. Uh, spam. Croiky, what a bounding humph druffle fuffle or whatever the weird human is speaking. Oh yes, we're going to get to that. <laughs> so, we've got Tessa pulling out a large sword. We've got a revolver. Why did anyone leave this revolver loaded with, with bullets? So, fun fact right there. Uh, what Tessa and, and Jay are using is a hand and a half sword. It's a longer sword. It's not a proper long sword because its blade is somewhat shorter, but it can be used both uh, with both hands in order to deliver way more powerful chops and slices. Good creepy abomination. Now then, again, this is an episode that is a homage to stuff like The Shining. It is all about the horror, and this episode played beautifully into the horrors of the Elliot Manor throughout the entire episode. And that's actually one of the reasons why there isn't much of a fight in this episode at all, because it's more about the horror than it is about the action. Remember that back to episode two, episode two had fantastic horror, but then the ending battle just, it got clunky there at the end and it just didn't quite fit with the rest of the vibe. This fight, however, does. And that's because Eldritch Abomination V is Eldritch Abomination V throughout and the fight does not stay around long enough to uh, to overstay its welcome. We need the basement key. This bird's from the future. This bird's from the future. I, <laughs> I kill you. Sin's coming. <laughs> yes. the gala. Who? Our sin? Nah, she's cool. Um, man, just this episode makes me so sad that Tessa's actually dead. Because I love Tessa so much, thanks to this one episode. That's when you can tell that the writing for a character is fantastic, when you only get to really see them once, and you're already in love with them. <laughs> uh, Roblox says, Episode 5 is still my favorite, even though anything important happens in the last 30 seconds, and the rest of it is useless now. Let me explain. All right, I'll let you explain, because I don't think that Episode 5 is really all that useless. Episode 5 really puts into context uh n and v which makes v's sacrifice in episode six just heartrending and that was important that was very important uh to continue to keep the audience hooked as well as to do something incredible with a with a character so episode five is a lot of setup but it is setup that puts a whole lot of stuff into context and uh, and I do really appreciate that. This is the kind of slower episode that we should have gotten more episodes of if the show had had a larger budget and more work to have actually made it all happen. Crazy Claws, come on in. Do your basement thing. We got the coma patient you creeped on. Not <laughs> creepy. Sweet. Sweet. <laughs> Boom. Good creepiness right there. Brief moments. The action is... The action is clipped. Why are you talking like that? <laughs> All right. So that's basically it right there. As far as this fight goes and its consequences, it doesn't really like because we don't even actually get to see how the fight resolves. That's a little little bit silly what we do know is that is that tessa and jay are able to make it to the gala in time to witness the massacre and v escapes in order to then corner n and help sin torture him uh which then leads to the really but to the really cute part where he helps awaken her with her broken glasses i really really that's one of, that honestly is one of the best romantic scenes uh that i have seen in a long time it was phenomenally uh, set up and executed <clears throat> now then let me actually talk a little bit about um let, uh, let me actually talk about what this scene does super super well when it comes to the writing so uh, so when it comes to writing action and also like writing tension and everything you want it to be clipped and I'll be honest, this is something I had to learn from other people. Uh, this was when I was writing my own action sequence 
sequences in the beginning. I love writing long, flowing sentences because that's just kind of how I think, and I just gonna go there. Uh, and I had to learn that no, you want to write in clipped sentences. And when you watch what's happening in the scene, you can reduce it to clipped, terse, powerful sentences that deliver each punch of action that you see here on the screen. Uh, but let me quickly get to what you guys uh, said right here. So people argue episode five would have been would have benefited as only a flashback episode where Uzi can go into the memories, but nobody can see or hear nor anything else she does. And we as the audience watch through her. That is an interesting interpretation. And that would have actually, I think, still served the, the larger purpose for setting up what's going to happen with V. However, there is also the hacking element and what happens between her and Dahl, which again sets up episode six and episode seven beyond. So there's a lot of heavy lifting that's being done in this flashback episode. Uh, Iso, funny joke, but the biggest letdown of the episode, oof, oof, oh, Iso, uh, the jerkiness of, the jerkness made Jay a human. <laughs> Iso, I think the reason I disliked it so much in comparison to the, ep the other episodes was the pacing. It was all over the place. Yeah, it does jump around a whole lot, which can be inconsistent for good proper horror. Horror is usually slower and building to a crescendo. Um. And so, well, let, so then let me, so let me say this right here. here. So if you, so if I were to describe this, like, let me just quickly describe this in like, as I said, in like short, punchy sentences, uh, but uh, short, punchy sentences, like once, like once Tessa said, how do we how, reckon, how do you, how do we murder ourselves a robo child, Jay? Hey, hey Tessa hit, Tessa hit, hit the suit of armor that she forgot wasn't, that she, that she forgot was there. She managed to grab it just before it toppled over. Or she saw the sword in its grip. Powerful, heavy, sharp. She pulled it. It from she pulled it from its sheath. Oh yeah, this will work. Turning around, she saw Jay with the pistol. That will do too. Swap. And, and then and, and so just that clipness, that 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 clipped approach. And then uh when we get, actually get to the fight, I'll do that again. Uh, let me though quickly read what Rogue has right here. I hope this is uh, then. This is why I hope Jay gets redemption out of everyone. Jay was the last one standing with Tessa before Sin made her move, taking control of all the drones, causing her to turn. And I agree. I do see potential for Jay to actually turn against Absolute Solver if things are done right. So again, coming back to coming back coming back then to how I would deliver this. This is actually where I would get a little bit eloquent before getting before getting short with the with the pros uh so tessa and jay hearing uh hearing n's warning start uh, start walking to him only to see something glimmer and shatter on the ground those glasses where had tessa seen those glasses before they looked familiar she remembered now she had given those glasses to tessa looks up v and then describe this twitchy monstrosity climbed like a spider along the ceiling, its wings spreading and then contracting, undulating with breath as a weird tail wriggled behind it. This monster wearing a maid's uniform, wearing the face of a drone she once knew so well, clawed its way to them. Above, in a flash of lightning, it vanished. Tessa, J, and N came back to back. Describe the whole thing that, that with the with the bird. Yes, a book now, absolutely. Again, if I were writing, this is how I would write uh, to to try to try to keep up that try to keep up that tension. So I've already set the stage for the tension with the with the horror aspect, and then back to back when he's like, "Ah, oh, Sid, now nah, she's fine, and she's fine." Before Tessa could respond, whoop. You can have some onomatopoeia on into there and then and then have her Tessa's on the back foot that she saw the claws coming right for her face. She was off balance, falling, no way of responding. Swing, clank, think uh, ever loyal Jay there right when she needed her pairing the blow, pushing N back, pushing V back and, and wielding the sword and just keep it clipped. As uh, as as uh, as V teleports right beside and 
smacks him across the face, sending the key flying. It fell right into the center of the hallway. As V dove and, uh, not, and pfft, Jay brought down the sword, impaling her hand, driving it deep into the carpet, taking back the key. He, he un, unperturbed, unperturbed V rips the sword right from her hand and hurls it right at end. And, and, uh, and just, again, just the, just the compactness of the sentences, a good bit of vocabulary, actionable, boom. You can recreate in prose what happens here in this excellent short fight sequence. And you can even have the little joke of, of Australian nonsense uh, there at the end. <laughs> okay. Uh, so uh, for uh, Dreige, Kazi, I know this is a random thought, but could there be a moment uh, where N, rather than making everyone emotional support, has to be supported by other characters? I would like to see that as well. That would be something that I would like to see maybe at the end of Episode 8. If Episode 8 ends with Uzi not coming back, I would like to see that. Um, the book says, I love how they made the robots look more human uh, here compared to the actual humans themselves. And that's because they definitely wanted you to identify more with the drones than with the humans for this show. Though Tessa is still a sweetheart. She absolutely is. My poor girl. Uh, she will always be remembered. The Amazing Gamer. Maybe the hacking is her watching the memory, but when Doll comes, Uzi is pulled out, misses key details, and she and Doll fight, and the audience gets back to see what Uzi is missing and needed to see. Uh, Sam says, I love how it sounds when she said when, when he says arson. Uh, Sam, like, bro, what are you thinking? uh the amazing gamer well the this shot this shot foreshadowed tessa's fate in a way as a victim of sin to be gutted and used as a skin suit and yeah i can definitely see that uh roblox you know that you know what this is taking too long to write i take back my previous statement <laughs> hey roblox you can always share it later on in a long comment in one of the videos and i'll be happy to read it all right so as far as the consequences of this fight goes again just remember, it's more about V than it is anyone else. This is all to set up the emotional uh, high point or low point, depending on your opinion, uh, for the end of episode six. And that's actually going to be the fight that we get to next. The fight where V finally loses and is defeated. Which, the setup to that is that the characters must go into the Cabin Fever Labs. They run into Tessa and Jay. They get caught on up. They go on in. There's a lot going on in episode six, uh, which leads to them after the whole little confession bit and everything to them trying to finally get to where we see Doll and Doll takes uh, the, the, the cockroach, which turns out to be the key necessary to get deeper into the cabin fever labs, into the proper cabin fever labs. And then Doll unleashes the sentinels that we have seen throughout the this episode this far. They have been properly set up as real dangers to everyone, and now they finally come on out to play. As Doll is like, well, Uzi, you threw in your lot with them, so bye-bye. Ding. Get around, get around, get around. Yeah, there's a word limit. Say that I mean, and that's to prevent people from writing massive essays. That would be hard for other people to read and get along with. And it, and now that we know what's really going on with Tessa, it now starts making a little bit more sense of why there's all these errors because they're not supposed to attack humans, and yet they're all like something is wrong. Uh, fun fact: Tessa was dead before Episode Four came out. Yeah, oof. Uh, she was dead before all the episodes came out. <laughs> Poor Tessa. And it's brilliant how that uh, how that visor is is helping to save her from being uh, uh, from being blasted away by the one drone who really seems to understand what's going on here. V V crawls off with a good little thing, a good little detail. Uzi begins all breaking out. <laughs> I love how he reuses the the arm. He comes on in in clutch and catches. Did I get it? Okay, so if I have any one gripe with how epic this scene is, 
it's V having the glasses. And I'll tell you why. Coming back to like how there should have been something where we get to see the absolute solver symbol flash across Dahl's face in episode one to kind of give us an idea that there's something going on. Um, it would have been great to see that like maybe like in episode two, actually, when Uzi is in the pod with all the other drones, that as Uzi is like repairing things, she then starts coming across something that V like flips out, like, don't touch my stuff. And Uzi's like, what? And then and be like, oh, yeah, like V's got stuff from like way back when that she won't let anyone touch. And then you're like, OK, OK, well, that and then and then back in episode five to then see the whole glasses bit and then to see them see the glasses come back right here to then realize, oh, V has always had the glasses from what happened at the Elliott Manor. She knows what happened, that, that connection between her and N has always been there. And that would have made it even more powerful, just bringing things together. The glasses, to me, do make sense. Because the glasses help V to actually be herself, and it just flashes back. It refracts the the, the crazy EMP light that the that the raptors are flashing around. Sure, you can, you can argue that that's not the way glasses work, and I can definitely say that. I wear glasses. Uh, my glasses don't refract the light back in other people's eyes. It'd be fun if they did, but they don't. But let's just roll with it because it, the glasses are meant to represent V returning to who she actually is. And we've seen that V is conflicted about everything that's going on during this episode. She's really sh shaken up and now V is absolutely back in the game. How are they? How they are and, and not and broken. Uh, v, did I get it? Sentinel, you should have aimed for the head. Roblox, that is brilliant. Applause to you using an Infinity War uh, quote. I love it. Uh, don't worry, Te Midbook says, don't worry, Tessa's very much alive in all our hearts. There inside, there's a bubbly Australian Tessa in each and every one of our hearts. Fly high, Mrs. Tessa. Yes, Tessa will always be in my heart. Uh, I had, I heard, heard a defense of why she had the glasses from someone and said she kept it in her coat this whole time. Looking how small the coat is compared to the glasses, I just laughed. And I, I agree right there. I would have liked to have seen, again, a little bit more of a reference to that the glasses could pop up, where, again, you're like, later on as you look back, you're like, oh, oh, okay, that all makes sense now. That's what I would have liked to have seen. Those is freaking on out, and this is good. This is the chaos. This is the chaos I was talking about earlier that it's okay to have it within your, within your story. So Uzi freaking out, Absolute Solver doing its deal. This is the chaos element that you like to see in a story where it makes anything potentially happen. At this point, people were watching this episode, no one knew what was going to happen. And now he goes in, in for the fight, and he actually gets this, this absolutely sweet, this sweet thing. With uh, the friend, the, the friend who taught me how to write really excellent uh, battle scenes was like fighting is like a dance, and we absolutely had that here with, with B. But B, come on, get into the action, girl. Oh, glasses gone. So right when everything seems good, we then get the sacrifice. Trust you. Pay off. Pay off from everything we've been seeing from, from episodes three, four, and five. Now all coming together for this moment. And yeah. It it just it hits. And as far as the consequences of this go, we see this immediately in episode seven, where N is freaking out, trying to claw his way back to V. Without V there, there isn't that. That backup and has always been acting with some kind of backup throughout everything other than episode one and even and actually even really in episode one there was still some backup either it was uh and and uh it was v and j when he was going into the colony and then after he was betrayed by j it was uzi who had his back and has always had someone who's had his back and now that he doesn't have v and when uzi leaves and when tessa leaves we see n just kind of like a kite in the wind just getting absolutely 
buffeted until uh, Nori comes in and saves him. So we get some, so we get some good thematic stuff going on, and just again, everything from the end of episode six flows into episode seven. It picks up right where it left off, and we we get episode seven in all of its great insanity. Uh, Lord McGurk, this scene still makes me cry. He was my second favorite character. Yeah, I was shaken when I saw it, and I still like it. Like not so much watching the scene, but like listening to the music. Like there've been a couple times where I've just like like sit like i just sat back closed my eyes listened to the music and just let the emotions flow uh, uh ends laser killed a drone in episode one uh yeah yeah he's got he's definitely got the laser and use everything that you have uh wrote to be fair they did show v with glasses in the first flashback that's true back in episode two then episode five shows v needing glasses uh, before she got turned into a murder drone, but she remembered enough to keep them. Which, yeah, and again, it would have been great to have seen um, like any evidence of her keeping those glasses. We don't need to necessarily see the glasses, but to just know that she kept things to herself, that would have been great. To be like, oh, she's been keeping these glasses all along? That is sweet and sad. Roblox, question. Do you think V knew like about Tessa not being Tessa? No, because she accepted Tessa. I think because what we see from episode seven, how, and also from the dialogue of episode six, that NV and J were immediately spirited away from the Elliot Manor. And if I'm correct, that Tessa was only killed afterwards and not during the massacre, that that would mean that Tessa didn't know. And as far as NJ and V would have known, at least, at least in the moment and what memories were given to them uh, later, uh, later on, like they they wouldn't have known what actually happened to Tessa. As far as they know, as far as V would have known, Earth has been destroyed, and she's just really keeping that to herself to protect N. We're missing context and everything, but I think that V really did believe that this was Tessa, but when Tessa started doing untessa like things, that that is when V started getting suspicious. Um... Let's see here. My book. Oh no, V. Uh, she went out with style. Poor N. I'm dying to know what uh, what that song that played in the background is. V sacrificed herself. I really hope she's somehow still alive. The song is uh, "Eternal Dream," and it you can look it up. "Eternal Dream" is fantastic. All right. So let's now finally get to the one fight that I know so many people have been looking forward to, and that is. The fight at the end of episode seven. I didn't. She just didn't. Wait. Something else did this to Dalton. You, you have to believe. So it no, begins right here with Tessa, as we now know who is. Well, there be more of you, uh, Who anyway. is fighting against them? We don't yet know that this is actually Sin in the moment. Uh, but here she is, about to kill Uzi. Do you know about the patch? Yes or no? One chance. Cured. You know why I keep you around it. And right there, that line, if you've been paying attention, is the line that clues you on in that this definitely wasn't a Tessa. Because it's been the same thing that was it was the same thing that was said earlier uh, by uh, by Sid in the same episode. <laughs> the shock my friend and I have when the slice happened. Absolutely. And no hesitation and scared me. Yeah, and finally hey, just like be epic. That should help. All I know is I need you to figure things out together. Okay, so real quick right here. So there's the there's the comment, the head rolling with no holes in it. This episode pushed the bounds of YouTube propriety because they showed a lot of blood. And the moment that you start, uh, the moment that you start showing a lot of blood is normally then when your stuff begins to get age restricted. So in order to get away with having all the blood that follows the helmet, they had to make sure that there wasn't any reference to the head bouncing around in the helmet. It's really, really weird. It's amazing what things you can get away with, uh, in terms of violence is so long as you don't show certain things, uh, the, the violence and maturity rating is really, really weird. And I'm going to take a drink of water. <laughs> and bonus. 
There goes the patch. <laughs> That's really sweet, big brother. <laughs> and there we go. Too bad you've served your purpose. Don't worry, your backups will forgive me. <laughs> yeah, this is a case of N being dumb like Basher with the solver antidote. And yes, N... Well, here's the thing. N is consistent in that he's a goof. He can do some amazing things, but he also will do some really stupid things. So, like, N, like, N is consistent in this episode, is my, is my counter. Rogue, I'm willing to bet OG, N, V, and J got destroyed at, uh, at, at the mansion, but Sin kept their personalities and enough memories to keep the facade up. Yeah, I think that that's a good a good argument. Or at least she transformed them enough that they definitely were not who they once were. And then... Here comes Nori. Using that pickaxe like a Nori, boss. Cutting off all, all the arms. You're freaking grounded. Angry. You're angry. <laughs> and then here, just the speed, the choreography. And hesitating because this is still Uzi in his mind. That's the which, as we talked about in uh, during the last uh, live stream about murder drones. This whole scene right here is Absolute Solver looking to get rid of Uzi. It's fighting so chaotically because it doesn't matter if it destroys Uzi's body. That's kind of the point. It's trying to get rid of the last couple hosts of Absolute Solver of its own power so that way it, that way, there's no one who can interfere with its plan of consuming the planet. So while we get hesitation from N right here, this is hesitation that works with his personality as has been now established multiple times. And and he begins freaking out when it becomes clear that Absolute Solver, that Sin, is using his own actions to kill Uzi. Right there. That's not him. That's that's Absolute Solver. When Nori comes on in. Whack. That's still my daughter in there. Max, get your head in the game, boy. Nori, come, Nori being the real MVP of this point. And now we get the, the, the launching of portals and black holes. <laughs> Again, the, their, their strategy has to be to keep on removing uh, Uzi's multiple limbs, so that way, uh, so that way, it's harder to use Absolute Solver. And right there. So again. That wink, it's like, we're going to kill your, like, it, uh, this is Sin absolutely playing around with N. I win either way. Either you kill Uzi with the pickaxe and, and I, and I lose a, and I lose a host that could turn against me, or you step in and prevent it and you give me the upper hand. That is what's going on here. And N does what N does. I mean, this goes all the way back to uh, episode three. And so he takes the hits. And from there, like, again, this, and then this again falls in line with, uh, with uh, the Absolute Solver's personality. It loves torturing its victims. It's taking its time doing this. It doesn't have to, but it does it because it enjoys... Uh, <laughs> it, it enjoys its its craft of, of hurting others. Which that hesitation, and this is where it gets fun, because again, hesitation is not certainly something you want to have in your fights, unless it works out for a character. And the hesitation on the part of Absolute Solver in order to torture these two souls, it works out perfectly because N gets to do this. <laughs> Was he dormant? Those things killed your frickin' mother! Oof. If only I had the power of slap like oh, that. I'm not. Hey, lady, you don't frickin' own me! <laughs> and there it goes. <laughs> 
So again, there, there, that's the that's the fight, the big fight thus far of the series, the biggest in terms of the powers that are thrown around, the action, the stakes, because this is all for the planets. And yet at the same time, it is kept on a very personal level as well, uh, be it for the relationship between uh N and Uzi, and also the relationship, the new relationship that's been formed between uh N and Nori, which is then followed up with this this horrific thing and this is why i feel like the battle doesn't actually feel out of place like it makes sense to have this absolutely epic fight against the against absolute solver and now that all the chips are down on uh, and all the cards are now coming down also onto the table uh, in order for absolute solver to win it has to pull out this trump card of fully revealing itself and what it did to tessa in order then to wield it wield its its powers to the max. It's like, fine, if I can't kill, if I can't get you to kill your best friend, I will kill your best friend for you. And, and I will do it. And I will do it myself. And, and it's, it's really no contest as uh, sin, uh, sin floors, both of them. So while they win the, while N wins the fight to save Uzi, they lose the fight to beat Absolute Solver, and that threatens the planet. And so, as far as so, like as far as this fight goes, like this is incredible. It does not break the tension or the horror of the episode. It fits in with everything that's been established. The personal stakes, the world building stakes, the plot stakes are all there on the table, there to be seen. The music is again on point. The characters are absolutely acting the way that they should. This, it, like, if you had told me that this would have happened after watching, like, episode one, it would have been like, that's cool, but I don't know if I would have really praised it so much or been that that excited for it, just because there's a lot of buildup that you need to go through to get to this moment. And Liam and his team absolutely improved over time, coming to understand what uh, what horror stories they were telling in each episode how much action was needed to complement that horror and never really overusing anything. All of these fights are good and clipped. They're the way that they should be. And, and they learned as they went how to properly set up, properly execute to set up the consequences and to try to tighten up any of the mistakes that have popped up in earlier, in earlier fight scenes. And that just happens to everyone. You'll be surprised. Like as someone, again, as someone who's written quite a few books and as someone who's published eight books, there are times I just went through that this year. I was rereading one of my books to get ready to write the sequel. And I was like, oh, there's so many mistakes still in this book. I, I hired an editor. I did everything to try to make this book book wonderful. Mistakes still slip through. It's just what's going to happen. And the reason why traditionally published books are way more clean is because they have teams of editors slaving away over your book to make it the best it can be. It's not just one person doing it alone with a bunch of other amateurs to make it the best they can be. It's a team of professionals to make it the best it can be. Uh, da -ba -da -ba -da. <laughs> they may have won the battle, but they have lost the war. Yes, it will all come down now to what we see uh, with Khan, Lizzie, and that, and potentially V, all now coming uh, onto the scene. And also what could happen with Jay? Because will Jay be turned? Will Jay, does Jay know what happened to Tessa? And if she doesn't, will she then rebel against Absolute Solver when the truth is made clear? Yeah, well, we've got, uh, there, there's a lot of questions still to be answered in the upcoming episode. And that's what we've got. We'll then see how the consequences all play out from the action in this episode into the next one and i am so excited for that all right so who how let's see how long we've we been here at this almost two hours of talking straight up murder drones in action there's still even more that we can talk about you guys have been saying a lot of stuff in the chat as well and that's been fantastic i've loved seeing the back and forths you haven't all agreed but you guys have been again fairly largely respectful with each other which i always appreciate and you guys have had great insights as well. So I I, I really love seeing uh, everything that's been going on right here. 
A uh, couple of quick things to read from you guys before we then hop topics uh, from my book. The H.P. Lovecraft vibes is especially strong in this one. I absolutely love cosmic horror, especially when it's done with great effort and great execution. 100 out of 100, the Murder Drones team did a great job. I agree. And there's definitely strong thing vibes in this episode as well, which was really, really good, great to see. I love, I like I, when I do my eventual retrospective on the whole season, I definitely want to like tap a little bit more into how like the thing is probably the one story that is the most present from episode to episode, though each episode almost acts as a homage to a specific uh, movie or subgenre of horror. Con on the bus. Con on the bus for the win. Mojo Service the Solver will get a body of its own and will no longer need hosts. I think it still will need hosts. I believe its body is the massive planet with the golden eye and that it uses hosts in order to execute its different uh, different shenanigans and schemes along the way. Uh, Short says this was a good stream. Hot topics? Don't you mean a hem for the show's sake? <laughs> uh, hot topic. Uh, yes, the next hot topic is, uh, I'm just going to quickly jump on, on over to uh, talking about uh, the mysterious disappearances, or as the manga is, Mysteries, Maidens, and Mysterious Disappearances. I highly recommend this, uh, this anime and its manga really to just about anyone, but especially to novice authors, because the first couple of chapters truly encapsulate a pro uh, like an issue that so that I think almost every author goes through. And it's that moment of rejection and that moment where you doubt that you could ever be an author where everything is just falling apart. And, uh, and it's, it's really a very, it's a very emotional, a very eye opening moment. I remember, I remember one of my, cause, and this will hit you multiple times as a creator. But I remember one of my, like, I had a week. I had a week of just absolute struggle busting through, could I even be an author? And I had heard Brandon Sanderson say once that he was going to write no matter what. If he had to do another job, he would do it, but he would never stop writing. And would it be okay if no one ever bought any copies of his books? He said, yes, because I, I just want to write. And I had to go on kind of on my own journey to come to that conclusion as well, because it's hard being an author and it's hard making a living being an author. It really, really is. And so for anyone who wishes to do that, just know it's so, so dang hard. And this, and the story captures that defeat for the main character, Sumeriko, as you get to see how she was once hailed as this great up and coming author, but she's lost the mojo. Everyone has rejected her. She is completely destroyed. She is alone. She's depressed. And it's, and it takes the adventures of the series to help her to once again find the excitement to write again and to become the author that she should be. And that is a journey that most of us creators will go on. And it's something that, that I think it's great to see other stories address that and other authors address that as well. Just that way you know that you're not alone. And hopefully to find inspiration that helps you to get out of it. And uh, that's something I'm really looking forward to seeing more of with this anime. And the other anime that uh, that, that I've recently been uh, been been watching is the remake for Spice and Wolf. Absolutely recommend it. I will be doing reviews and analyses for the major arcs of the season, uh, especially because this is the story that helped me to learn stuff about economics. So woohoo! <laughs> learn some economics there. Uh, but yeah. Yeah, I, I haven't had too much time to actually get too much into anime this week. A little bit sad, but hey, when you're busy, you're busy. You got to do what you got to do. Uh, uh, but I definitely recommend mi uh, uh, Mysterious Disappearances and Spice and Wolf to anyone who's got the time to watch some anime. Two good shows. Uh, let me then uh, quickly uh, come back to some of the comments right here before we then jump on over to some writing advice that we can do before I wrap things up. Uh, so if you guys have any questions about your own stories that you wish to put into the chat, now is the time to do that. And we'll have a conversation and then we'll close from there. Uh, so moving on from hot topic. Uh, I, so I might have to alter the whole story of my sci-fi horror story because murder drones is going in the exact direction that my story is going. LOL. 
I don't say that you have to change it. Uh, sometimes, like, ah, uh, there are a couple of stories that I have written where a show started doing the exact same thing. I'm like, dang it. If only I could have somehow magically written my whole novel, like, nine months before you, I would have been the first. Uh, it just happens. What you need to do is you need to make the story your own, ISO. When you can make the story unabashedly your own, then it's going to be awesome and uh, and great, and no one's no one's really going to complain. Um, da, 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 uh, Mojo, if N is dog, V is cat, Uzi is crow, what is J then? Uh, she is the spooky snake crab. That's what she is. <laughs> uh, me book, the golden all seeing eye. My tinfoil hat is is in a chokehold. Uh, just please treat your tinfoil hat with respect. Uh, uh. Sam Shorts, I'm editing my episode for my show right now. Excellent. Great on you. I hope everything's going well. Iso, I'm finally getting around to reading Mistborn. Iso, how do you like Mistborn? It's one of my favorite trilogies. I'd love to hear uh, your your feedback on it. Uh, Roblox, uh, sin, uh, Roblox uh, sin when she wins. I finally rest and watch the sunset on a grateful universe. Absolute solver. The hardest sacrifice requi requires the strongest wills. Or the strongest sacrifices require the strongest wills. Roblox, I don't read, I don't read uh, too much, mainly due to time constraints. Yeah, and that's why a lot of people actually uh, uh, do audiobooks. Uh, so that way they can read a story, at least they can consume the story and do other things. Because sitting down to read sometimes, yeah, it's a little bit difficult. Uh, Sam, I'm sure I'm so excited to put the episode 7 soundtrack on my playlist, watching Murder Drones, then anime. I'm Omega. Absolute Solver is a lot like Common Rider Evolt, a black hole wielding menace who eats planets for dinner and takes the main character as host. Yeesh. Ah, Common Rider with as many, as many uh, fantastic iterations and, and stories and adventures. Mojo Service may be getting idea of N versus Solver battle. Blobfish. Sin is Capybara. But Capybaras are so cute. I guess Sin's also cute. So maybe Sin and Capybara do have something in common. Uh, she is a blobfish. <laughs> um, okay, so Hannah, how to write a silent protagonist? Huh. Okay, then. So, uh, so Hannah, there are there are different ways in which you can write a, uh, a silent protagonist. You can be really, really bold and have your your silent protagonist do everything without ever revealing what is in their head or whatever it is that they say. Like that's taking, um, I think it's road to heaven. It's the movie. I might be wrong with that right there to the max where like the main character set, like almost never says anything. You have no idea what he's thinking. Really? You just see actions. You can write a character where it's all just action and you see from that character, you see then, you then get the perspectives of all the other characters. That is experimental. It's hard to do, but it can have some interesting payoff where everyone else is the one who's speaking and you get to see their thoughts. And the main character, the one who's propelling the entire story forward, never speaks and you never get to hear what's in their thoughts. However, that can be very alien to a lot of people to read. Uh, to read, So many times you can just have a, a protagonist who doesn't verbally say anything, but is constantly thinking. So that way you can get their thoughts, you can understand how they're interacting with the world, and you can see everything from their eyes, from their perspective, but their interactions with all the other characters is very difficult because they're mute. Whether because they're, they're clinically mute and, mute and really cannot say anything, or because they just choose not to. And if it's a medical thing, that's interesting because then you then ex explore the character with how they try to communicate without speaking. Or if it's a choice that they don't speak, then you can explore why they don't speak. And it can be a morality thing. It can be like a vow. It can be a promise. It could be a curse. It all depends on what story Hannah you wish to tell. But when it comes to writing a silent protagonist, you either want to just make sure that you're in their head and that you can see everything from their perspective, or you describe the entire story from the perspectives of multiple other characters who are all dealing with the silent protagonist. Uh, there's also the other version of the silent protagonist where they do speak, but you never get into their head, and so you're just left with whatever they say. 
that's not necessarily silence, but it can get very frustrating to the audience because they don't know what the character is thinking. And many times authors do that, not just simply through italicizing um, words to say, hey, look, these are the thoughts that they're having, but also many times they describe how a character is thinking or feeling. If you don't do that, you just have a character seemingly robotically speak or you get or you describe the emotion with which they speak, but you don't get anything else other than that. It, it removes the audience a little bit from the silent protagonist. A silent protagonist is really kind of like a, a hand grenade that you're dancing around with because it could either work really beautifully or it can blow up in your face if the audience does not connect with your protagonist. If they don't connect with your, with your protagonist, you will lose a lot of people to your story. Um, da, 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 da. I saw so far, it's ridiculous, not bad, but ridiculous but ridiculous how much better it is than mine. I'm not discouraged or anything. I'm actually quite inspired and I'm barely past the prologue. I'm looking forward to reading more. Oh yes. Oh, Iso, you are in for a wild ride with Miss Board. I love it. The, the last book, book in the series is one of the few books that's ever made me cry. And it still makes me cry when I read it. <laughs> it's so dang good. Uh, I'm Omega. I've got the script for issue one of my story down, and I need to work on episodes two and three, working on Deltarune Animatic as well. I'm Omega. You are busy, and I'm loving it. Uh, Mojo, uh, bro, why did the screen show some girls behind? Because this is, uh, this is Mysterious Disappearances, and there's a lot of women in it. <laughs> TV account. Hey, I'm new here. I also I always thought the solver was like the hole from uh, Doro He Door. Oh, oh, that ooh, TV account. That's something interesting. I had not thought of that. That's a neat. That's a neat connection right there. Uh, good. Good on pointing that out. Uh, me book. Uh, you know, I've always wondered this when a story has a wide range of characters, etc. Are any of the characters based on real life people or even people that the authors themselves know. Interesting. I'm going to say yes. You write characters based on who and what you know. And a lot so like for instance uh when I was writing when uh, as as I've been writing I should say my flagship series The Legend of the Ten Lords the two main characters Ben and Jessica are based on on the personalities and actions of some of the boys and girls that I knew in high school. Some of the coolest boys and girls that I knew. Uh, so I definitely draw from that. And I also draw experience like for Z, uh, for Zemon from my book, bleed steam and steel. I based him on a missionary I met who had no legs and he had been a football player uh, with no legs. And the guy was epic. Uh, he could do anything that he, that he says mine to him not having legs didn't mean squat. Uh, this guy, this guy was an inspiration to me, especially around the same time that I was having my feet reconstructed and I was relearning to walk. Uh, seeing what this guy could do was just inspiring. And I kind of took my, uh, I took my experience with being in a wheelchair and being on crutches for two years after I had my feet reconstructed and just meeting this guy who was just an absolute hero. Uh, and I merged those experiences and that person together to create Zemon, who's one of my favorite characters to write for. Um, so yeah, you definitely will create characters, uh, based on, uh, you will definitely create, um, uh, characters who are based on the people and the events that you've known in your own life. And that's why it's really good to get to know as many people as you possibly can, because they will inspire, uh, all different kinds of characters. And it's awesome. <laughs> Uh, I, so I just looked back at my art project from last semester and I compared it to my last drawing I made just now. The improvement I made in two months is actually insane. I so that is amazing. And I've actually wanted to do that. I need to set aside time to like do a drawing a day. And because I a uh, little spoiler into future projects for Lars, I want to write a field guide with illustrations of dragons for my for my uh, series White Fire which is about dragons, uh, a really crazy dragon world. And if you kind of want to get an idea of what that world is like, I know I'm advertising right here, but deal with it. Uh, my book, Tumble Teller, uh, Tumble Teller uh, gives you a glimpse into that world. 
uh, that, uh, that white fire takes place in and it is fantastic. <clears throat> uh, let's see here. Other things, guys with no legs didn't mean squat. Hmm. Is that a pun I hear? Yes. Yes. Kind of <laughs> Hannah, this anime, bro. Oh yes. Yes. Uh, I, the, 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 mon the manga too, it does, it does get a little bit explicit. I will say that. Uh, nowhere near anything, uh, like, uh, oh, pff, what is it? Uh, the, the, the recent debauchery anime, the gushing over magical girls, uh, nothing like that. Uh, but there are definitely some gratuitous shots, which as I said in my review video are definitely going to make some people really raise their eyebrows and be like, what, what? Uh, yes, uh, there are some reasons to it. Uh, and I will I will tackle that as the anime unfolds. Uh, TV account continuation. It made sense at first, mostly thanks to the holes origins. If you read the manga, you know, especially when you see how mistreated these drones get. Uh, Sam Shorts, yeah. How did this go from a merge on stream to an anime stream? Uh, that's because I just happened to uh, move my footage on over. I did say, I did say. That we'd be talking murder drones, anime, and then writing. And I just happened to bloop, move us on over here. Say it's basically at the end. So I can pop on over again to other murder drones uh, feed. Huzzah. All right. So I believe that pretty much. Uh, yeah, that, that pretty much catches us up uh, right there. So uh, we've gone. Uh, we've gone on for, uh, wow. Uh, two and a half hours. Yeah. Uh, we, uh, it's now about time for me to start wrapping things up right here. So thank you everyone, uh, for, for coming along for this amazing stream and for being a part of all of this. Again, you guys have been fantastic in the chat and I really appreciated that a guy with no legs, uh, dog day. Hey, I relate. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And I, I enjoy, I enjoy, uh, I, I, again, I just really enjoyed uh, writing Zemon, writing a character who's in a wheelchair based on actual experiences of my own and the guy that I knew. So, I, yes, you can have a really cool spy in a wheelchair, and it makes sense. Uh, then Roblox, these kinds of anime is why I watch shows like Murder Drones and Yoko Senki. <laughs> you know what? It's true. Like, it's, it's not necessarily for everyone. Again, I'm not going to force anyone to watch this. I'm still surprised how many people come along to my videos about Vermai and Golden are like, I need to know where this is. I think that they, th I think that they believe that I'm pitching to them a hentai show. I'm like, this isn't hentai. It's just explicit. <laughs> Murder drones episode eight will break us. Yes. Yes, it will. Uh, I, I truly do believe that serial designation N gives you a drawing. It's a dog. I need a, a sweet doggo from, uh, from N. All right. So again, guys, thank you so much uh, for being here for all of this. This was fun. This was great. Um, as uh, as far as things to look forward to in the future, I'm going to start pushing myself to do a video uh, that um, that is going to be about why Hollywood hates has been hotel because there is a story that needs to be told right there, and it's 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 some unpleasant medicine that a lot more creators need to need to swallow uh, because unfortunately Hollywood hates us. Uh, the traditional publishing agency also doesn't really like us. And it's who we've got to play ball with a lot of the times. So there's a conversation to be started there. And I hope to do it by beginning with has been hotel and what's been happening there. So that's a video. I can't promise exactly when I'm going to have that out, but I will have that out. And uh, even though Tevin isn't here tonight, uh, he's going to be happy that I uh, that I will be doing some more D and D videos in the near future. So yeah, things are coming on up. Uh, get excited! And uh, and I did get an idea uh, from uh, someone actually just today uh, for another murder drones video that I I will I again I cannot promise exactly when I will get this out, but I will get started on it. Uh, which will be looking at Murder Drones fan fiction and what the fanfic authors have actually done to contribute to uh, to Murder Drones and how good their stories are 
And I've even been asked what kind of a fan fiction would I write as far as uh, Murder Drones goes. Thad's Shindig is definitely one of them. So uh, that will be a, that'll be a video that I will be working on eventually. No, no. Uh, not all fan fiction is awful. <laughs> uh, we definitely had some of our videos back, not videos, our, our podcast episodes back in the day would tear into bad fan fiction. But we've kind of stepped away from that because we're like, we're trying to actually help other authors and not tear them down. Maybe we should be a little bit nicer to them. But hey, you can definitely check out some of the some of those old episodes are still available out there. Uh, and you can listen to us tear into stuff like uh, Secret of Shiobi, uh, Sonic High School, which is incredibly explicit. If you thought that the anime that you just saw cl clips for was bad, you haven't read Sonic High School. <laughs> and also, we were the only. Also, we are the ones on the internet who preserved the only copy of uh, My Bad Boy Link, which is an awful Legend of Zelda fan fiction. Oh my gosh. It's so bad. Uh, so we definitely did that, but we're now kind of moving on a little bit and really trying to find the more positive on the side of fan fiction. And when we see the negative, uh, help those authors to see the error of their way. So uh, that will be stuff for the future. And I'm sure you guys will have plenty of things to say about that. <laughs> Uh, real quick for to Midbook's question before we uh, before we end here, why does Hollywood hate has been hotel when Holly Weird is built on satanic rituals anyway? Well, Midbook, not all of Hollywood is based on satanic rituals. There are some cults. Uh, <laughs> yes, yes, uh, and uh, and I don't know why people make such. I'll be it's not to make little of some of the weirdness that comes out of those cults, but way more people. People are a part of that stuff than you might think. One of the creepiest instances in my life was going to clean up a dorm uh, in college after a Christian uh, youth retreat, and those kids were doing were doing demon summonings in the dorm. It was creepy. It was bad. <laughs> <laughs> so a lot more people get in on this stuff, mostly because they think it's cool. They think it's edgy uh, and uh, and don't really see anything all bad in it. Uh, Hollywood definitely is filled with a lot of really odd people. The reason, though, why Hollywood does not like has been hotel in short. And I'll dive more into this is because they are ticked that uh, Vivian Medrano or Vizzy Pop managed to do everything that they've been wanting to do for years and did it better than them. Having LGBTQ characters as main characters doing their thing, musical, which was actually pretty good. Uh, in fact, actually, uh, this is this, and this is actually one of the reasons why you won't find many reports on this because uh, the, the, the black rabbit hole that is 4chan loves the soundtrack from has been hotel. Uh, and I, I found all of these different stories uh, online about people that Hollywood hates loving has been hotel. And so they're like, how there's no way that they, they can really shape that to, uh, to, to feed some of their more negative narratives. It's a whole massive can of worms that I'm going to get more into to show like, it's just bad. And, and that much baggage to go up against is one of the reasons why it's so hard to be an outsider. Like many of us creators are trying to make it big and just knowing that there's this, that there's this monolith of entertainment that doesn't want us to succeed in part because they're jealous. And that's just sad because entertainment has plenty of room for everyone. And it comes down to us then comes down to us as the creators to create that positive space that that is deservedly for all of us to tell our stories in and let other people who get to hear our stories and watch our stories and listen to them, read them, that they then choose what stories they like and those stories then are then given the chance to continue on. That's the way that the market works. That's the way that storytelling has worked even before capitalism and communism and all that stuff ever came into being. And we just kind of need to go back to that. And if Hollywood were to actually do that again, Hollywood would have immense success because Hollywood has all the resources to succeed. 
So yeah, <laughs> rant, uh, rant done. <laughs> Has been hotel killing it lately. Get it. <laughs> if we cancel Hollywood, then we don't get TV and Roblox. You are absolutely correct, which is why I don't want to see Hollywood die. I just want to see Hollywood get, 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 put their big boy britches back on and their big girl britches and actually get back to work telling awesome stories. And there are people who still do that. It's just getting harder and harder. CGI is getting lazy. I don't understand why. Ugh. Quick last thing from Roblox. I have seen at least 70% of all Murder Drones content, and I can and I can confirm that the majority is either comics or edits. Indeed. All right. <laughs> so, uh, with all that, that being said, guys, again, thank you so much for being here. This was, again, another really fun uh, live stream, and I look forward to seeing Seeing you guys all again in the next video. Until then, you all take care of yourselves. Keep on writing your stories. Create your stories. Draw your stories. And do it because your stories need you. You need your stories. And whether or not you believe it, the world really does need your stories. Probably now more so than ever before. And with all that being said, y'all, thank you for coming by. And choose.